clock. So maybe what I can do is just do the housekeeping stuff, um, make sure that if there is anybody new on today, uh, you know how this all works. And, um, and then we can uh, get into what we're gonna be talking about. So online discussion venue, evidence-based discussions on dental sleep medicine, Pericle protocols are welcome, helps us expand our thinking, but just reference it as such. And of course, BYOB. Here we go, a uh, good Niagara a Riesling here that we're, we're doing. And um, let's see, keep in mind, uh, keep it kind, uh, mute the mic when not speaking, make sure that you're introducing yourself uh, so everybody knows who's, who's speaking. Message your organizer if you want to speak, that, that's helpful. Um, and keep it respectful, non-confrontational, avoid profane unless you really mean it. And um, that helps it uh, really make your point. If you, We know if you're swearing, you really, really mean this. Otherwise, just don't swear. Uh, please don't inter interrupt others. Uh, clothing is not optional. And uh, I mentioned it's uh, BYOB. I want everybody flashing a glass every once in a while, even if it's water in it. Audio options, click on the wagon wheel and uh, select computer or phone. And if it's computer, make sure you're wearing some type of headset and select uh, the parameters on the microphone, the speakers set up there. It'll guide you as to what to do. If it's phone, just select the country, dial the toll-free number, and enter the access code in audio pen. Okay, and there's a chat option. Uh, people, since we're spending much more time online these days doing this type of stuff, this is becoming very second nature, but this is for the benefit of the you know, people that are, are, are new, you know, jumping on and, and so that they, they know how to navigate around. So you can uh, send a message to a specific individual or you can uh, send a, um, a message to the group. So uh, as always, I really like to start off by acknowledging our sponsors and thanking them for their support and thanking them for everything they do for our industry. As I always mention that uh, you know we have appliances that keep uh, becoming refined and improved uh, with features, and it's because of their investment in in this field that we have these tools of the trade that keep improving, and appliances that keep improving. So I thank them for their contribution and their efforts, and and for their continued support. So DSM speaking, just like being here, except you're not looking for that silver lining. And today we're going to be speaking about. OSA appliance selection. So this is not really meant to be a lecture format and it won't be, but I'd like to just sort of start it off with a few slides and share a few thoughts and then take um, basically represent oral appliances as being in categories, different categories. And then what we can do is we'll get to a category and then uh, reach out and if anybody has um, a particular interest in that category of appliance or good experience in that category of appliance, we're absolutely interested in, in your feedback and maybe you can explain uh, what you look for, what you do and so forth. And this is really a group discussion. I'm just really putting the slide up there for the category so that we have a topic. And then we'll go through all, once we get through all the different categories of appliances, we'll in essence have spoken about all the different types of appliances that you can use. And so um, what the next couple of hours is going to be is an opportunity for all of us to leave with the collective knowledge of everybody in, that's on here today has. Because if we're talking about a herb style appliance, then you know everybody chips in and let, let us know uh, their, their experiences, or negative or positive, right, or what to look for, and then we all leave with that benefit. So to start off, of course, we know most oral appliances that we think of these days, are you know, custom made upper and lower, you know, advanced the jaw. However, you know, it would be wrong for us to not at least acknowledge the fact that there's over the counter devices and there's also tongue retaining devices. So we, something needs to be said about that. Now with regards to over the counter devices, really all I'm gonna say is, the literature shows us very clearly that custom oral appliances are superior to uh, prefabricated and that uh, oral appliances that are prefabricated devices don't perform as well um, as, as custom made appliances. Nevertheless, you know, that's really the only slide I have on OTCs. What I'd like to know, is there any over the counter devices that anybody's using and for what purpose that you find particularly helpful? This is an opportunity for us to share. And basically this is the way we'll handle today. So people can you know, speak on a topic that's on here. So uh, reaching out, is there anybody that's using an over-the-counter device? What is it? 
how to use it, when, and, and, and why do you find it helpful? So let's um, let's 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 talk for a second about something you said, John. Um, what you what you said was the literature demonstrates that over the counter appliances are less effective than custom appliances. Superior. Why? Okay, then, then we can go to each individual study. One of the, the biggest reasons is is um, the patient dropout. You know, we, we have a we have the um, SnorRx or ApneRx, whichever version they used in that particular study, same device that demonstrated that they could prove that you know if you use a SnorRx and then um, and, you know they got a good result, this would demonstrate a good result with the custom-made appliance in the same patient. And, and related, but you, when you look at their data, 25% of the patients dropped out because they could not comfortably tolerate wearing appliance, poor retention, uh, you know, excessive salivation, a number of reasons, right? So you got something that is going to discount 25% of the people right off the bat because we don't have that that type of non-adherence with with a custom-made appliance. So to me, that's the the, the biggest uh, reason. Other studies will show maybe perhaps lack of adjustability and and you know there's a there's a host of different reasons that a, a custom i'm sorry an over-the-counter device will fail as opposed to uh, uh where, where a, a custom-made appliance would not have failed so so here's my point many people read this that superiority statement and make an assumption that for some reason these appliances aren't as effective uh, that and at our point as you know is to constantly re remind people that John's first instructor taught him that a fish hook could use could hold an appliance for uh, draw forward it would be as effective as an expensive um, uh, silencer and that it's so it's not that and and this is something that really upsets me on a regular basis when people say well you know i i, I tried this appliance and it was you know they i used a uh, tap and it wasn't successful so i i went to the uh, digitized uh, uh prosomnus and it was successful so therefore you know prosomnus had in this case was more successful was 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 superior to in in terms of eff efficacy and there are, I think it's important that we, we point out that it's not the, anything about the mechanism in terms of its, 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 how it operates in terms of posture, but there are management factors. More importantly, there are management factors. Yeah. And the, um, and the management factors with the over-the-counters are, 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 are massive. I, I'll tell a brief story, and I'll let you finish your thought, John. Then I'll tell a story. I'll tell the Zipa story, which I think everyone will find interesting. I know John will. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, 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 um, I see John Bose is there, and I, and John's familiar with the story better than anyone. Um, I get approached many, many years ago, uh, 2014, 2013 by the owner of Zipa, and uh, their thought was is they he, he brought to me a, an over-the-counter appliance that you may have seen uh and it told me how, how he was going to sell and how effective it was and wanted me to become involved the last thing i wanted to be involved with was a was an over-the-counter appliance for many many reasons um uh and to this day uh, uh we're i don't know how many of you are tired of hearing uh, the Zipa ads and seeing them on on Facebook, etc. And um, again, making claims that we all understand aren't 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 valid. And it's just beyond me. And I'll end with this: it's beyond me that our FDA has allowed. Well, we, 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 that I I am forced to tell my dentist that I work with that it is inappropriate for you to treat 
snoring without a diagnosis when in fact the patient then can turn around and get an, an, an appliance approved for snoring over the counter. Beyond me, beyond me that we have allowed that. Yeah, I agree that's a, a major problem and, and, and very much an impediment. Um, well, we all know the reason that they're, they, they've got that regulation in place, but, but at the same time, uh, I think that it does as much harm as good. Um, agreed 100%, Barry. Obviously, it's more about what we do with the appliance than it is about the appliance itself. However, there's different characteristics for different appliances, which we'll be talking about, and um, has implications for delivery, implications for existing or missing teeth, and so forth. And, and um, that, that'll come out as we discuss the different designs. Is, is there any particular custom appliance that uh, anyone has used that they think is particularly good, if, that if you needed to use an appliance on an interim basis or um, either to just to help a patient through a time period before they can get their, their, their custom appliance made or they're traveling to Europe uh, in, 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 in three days, and their appliance was lost and they needed something to help them through the next month while they're gone. You know, this type of thing. Is there any over-the-counter device that anybody on the forum today has, has had experience with that is particularly good? This is a good time to, to bring that forward. All right, I'll add one because no one is. Um, there is, um, uh, here's another, mind-boggling example of FDA but uh, there is a over there is an oh, essentially um, it, it's not truly over the counter it's still delivered by a dentist but it's made by Jim Jim Boyd it's called the snore hook and the uh, snore hook is is a, a tap concept appliance with an anterior um, uh, um, uses actually uses a uh, uh, the MDSA which people in Europe, Alex, you may be familiar with the MDSA. Um, uh, it was a, 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 a citration assembly established by Bird in Australia, and then he sold it, and he went to sell it in the United States, but uh, uh, Thornton went after him, and they came up with an agreement, because it's tap-like, they came up with an agreement that Thornton wouldn't sue him if he would stick to um, uh, Australia and to Europe. So he continues to sell it in Europe. Uh, that's the that's the, the the titration assembly piece that Boyd uses, and it's it's a it's a flexible uh, 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 base uh, for upper and lower that you add that you add thermocouple to, and then you create your own appliance, uh, and and uh, you actually create the appliance in the chair. Uh, so for an emergency basis. For a patient that needs that needs this broken something or it's gone away, or some in some cases we used to use them occasionally for if someone that really needed to be treated right away while we were waiting, we would make them a snore hook. Um, they would break something and we couldn't get the appliance fixed. We could make them a snore hook. It was inexpensive. It could be done quickly. Um, and here's the mind blowing fact: not only is it FDA FDA approved, it's approved for Medicare. Hmm. Don't don't even start me, okay? So it's approved for Medicare. So in fact, there are some some appliance, some dentists who want to sell like an EMA and want Medicare approval. So what they do is they sell the EMA as the secondary appliance, make a snore hook at the insertion visit as their backup, but submit it as their primary appliance because now they can get Medicare approval. You, you, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, I, I wouldn't have ever been ingenious enough to make this stuff up. Well, what level do they pay? Uh, the, uh, is there different levels for Medicare? Because um, that no. certainly would be paid for the same level as uh, a Herbst appliance, which would have much higher cost. Same, same, same coverage. Same, wow. It's either approved or it's not. And there's not different categories. Well, I don't deal with Medicare, so I'm not. You know, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, there's yeah. good and there's shitty, and then right. but uh, but they, they, they <laughs> because I mean it, so I was allowed to say that, John. Right, I mean, right. Yeah. 
Right, right, right. So, so the, the point is, there are different categories, so it would go into a lower category. No, it, was, it was a joke. It was a joke. Oh, was, okay, okay, okay. It was an attempt at internet humor. There you uh, go. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what's what's uh, the comp well? You can't you can't make it in the states then. It's not available. What? This normal. Well, sure it is. So I don't understand what what agreement did they come to with Keith? Oh no no no. So Bird came to an agreement with Keith that he wouldn't sell his MDSA appliance. Right. The, boy, the buys the MDSA and sells it as part of his unit for the snore hook. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So and what is just out of curiosity, what is the cost approximately of of of, of the of the components? <clears throat> Hundred and twenty dollars. So 120 US, and then how long would it take your auxiliary? I'm assuming you would get an auxiliary to put it together. Half hour. Do they need impressions? Do they need impressions? No, no, no. no it's like a thermocrill. You just so, so you oh, actually. Thermocrill. Okay. So about uh, I'm sorry, half an hour you said? Half, half hour, 40 minutes. Okay. So 120 and um, half hour, 40 minutes, and and the patient's got something to wear. Okay. At a, at a um, Medicare fee of 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 anywhere from 1,200 to 1,800 dollars. Interesting. So it's interesting when you mentioned Medicare again, because the appliance I was going to throw forward is 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 the MyTap, out of out of all of the um, the MyTap appliance, uh, Barry. So out of all of the you know, over the counter devices, I, I'm particularly fond of that one for for two reasons. Uh, it's very 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 small footprint in the mouth. So from that perspective, it's very comfortable. It's not big and bulky, hockey puck feeling like you know, like a lot of the other um, over-the-counter devices. And of course, it's got this protrusion sticking out. But you know, I mean, it's only meant to be a temporary appliance. So you know, I've never had anybody not wear it because of that. If they decided to go ahead with it, right? So it's never been a a problem for them. And I like I like the very fine adjustability and the fact that you can because it's made of thermocrop too. I'm not familiar with the the appliance you just spoke of, um, the thermocrop body on it with with the with the, the MyTap. I mean, you can literally you know reheat it up and readapt it even several months later. So it becomes then even if you've made one up front as on a temporary trial basis. Um, it becomes even a backup appliance that can yeah, stick but, around for forever because you know, a year down the road, you come back in, heat it up, put it back in the mouth, and, and they've got uh, uh, something back in their mouth while, say, their, their custom-made appliance has gone to the lab to get repaired or whatever, right? A, a couple things. First of all, again, we're not talking about an over-the-counter yet. Keith is talking about selling this MyTap over-the-counter. And, and if it weren't for COVID, I truly believe that by the end of the year, uh, MyTap would have been in Walmart. I, it's coming, but well, but it's, it's okay. No, so it's, when I when I my, when I say so this is important, we define this because when I'm thinking over the counter, I'm thinking all prefabricated appliances, whether they're by dentist prescription or something you can buy from a, a drugstore or on the internet, prefabricated as opposed to something that's custom made. So that's the way I'm defining it in, in my mind. So well, that's it would, great. It would that's great. The but you just. Cap, yeah. But you just made up the definition to fit you because that's not how that's not that's not the way the world if the if you say to the world if you say to the dental community an over the counter appliance it means an over the counter appliance it means uh, uh, Silent Night wouldn't fit it um, uh, Zipa would fit it uh, there are some others uh, Snorex is, I think is is one that fit where you can call in and get your order and for $99 have one shipped to your house with instructions on for you on how to fit it in your mouth. I got it. That's so so the citations on this slide here are talking about prefabricated appliances versus custom made appliances. Okay? The way I've used the OTC term here is off label I guess. Uh, where and because I I, I I bundle them all the same. Like it's either prefabricated or it's custom made. I get it. But um, but the point is that what we're talking about is something prefabricated comes out of a box versus custom made. Whether it's by dentist prescription or ordered online. You know that that's that's sort of the defining uh, factor of, of, for the purposes of, of this discussion and and effectiveness. Right. How many of us? Uh, have used appliances with um, thermocrill. So I we we can't see a lot of faces. What what that 
there. Well, they okay. have to turn their, their webcams on. I, I've asked politely once. Maybe you can ask less politely. Uh, but if you if you click on your webcam, then then you appear, and it's a more of a personal experience for those of us that that have it on, and we can see each other, right? And when someone's talking, you know. Well, you're so you'll all have a you'll all have a little button that which is like so looks like a webcam, like a camera, yeah. and if you click on it, then then your 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 um, video will appear. I, I've used so the we got, we got 23 people. We got 23 people on right now, and there's only six people have their their cameras on. So while you're getting the cameras turned on, let me make a comment, if I may. Please. Um, both the snore hook and and the uh, uh, mic app, even though they are kind of prefab appliances, they they kind of have to be adapted. Right. Where, whereas, uh, for me, it's a matter of semantics. Maybe an over-the-counter device is not adapted with thermocryl by a dentist. Well, but you know, when you think about it, they're all adapted because they all have some type of a, 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 a thermoplastic type of material that has to be heated up and then adapted to the teeth. It's just that you know, typically they're much bulkier and yes. there's much more material as opposed to the thermocryl, which is like a thin layer of material. That's that's what makes these two particular appliances more desirable is the smaller footprint in the mouth. But at the oh, end of the day, they all have to be adapted. I mean, I think there's a couple of appliances that just have a trough that, you know, you, you put them on over your teeth and there's no, really nothing, nothing, um, but though, I can't imagine those being very retentive on the dentition. Uh, uh, John, you're right. Are all, the difference is who's doing the adaptation. Who exactly. does the adaptation? If and the patient does the adaptation, it's over the counter. If it's yeah. not, if the yeah. dentist does the patient, it's not over, not considered over the counter unless you're John Viviano. Yes. Well, well, Steve, Steve yeah. Carsonson, Steve Carsonson is talking about uh, this dispensing these my taps, especially in this COVID environment, uh, with maybe a little YouTube video and having the patient deliver them uh, themselves at home. Well, I've I've actually done that. Okay. And so what what Airway Labs will do? Uh, first of all, let me go back to two other things here, or one of the comment. Both those appliances are titratable. Most of the other over-the-counter appliances are not really are not really titratable quite quite that easily. So with Steve Carson and what they're doing with Airway Labs, Airway will drop ship the MyTap to the patient's house. Then they have some videos that explain how to adapt it. And then you can do a telemedicine visit with the patient and actually get it delivered. I, I did do that, not necessarily because of, of COVID-19, but the patient lived 200 miles away from me. Okay, and, and it was during the winter. And, and that worked out worked out very well because you can coach them through the whole thing. I'm not saying it should be standard of care. I, that's a whole different conversation. But how, how did the fitting go? Uh, um, well, yeah. Now the videos I, I sent the the videos to the patient in advance. So I put a link to my Dropbox. Had the patient watch those prior to me walking through it with them. Then I had an appliance in my hands. And the patient had their appliance, which was drop shipped to their house. And, and then I would show them how to disassemble it, uh, which one was the upper and lower to make sure I got that right. And then I could actually see what they were doing. Um, the biggest problem is them just having a computer in the same room where they have hot water. <laughs> I mean, but, but I mean, it worked out, worked out pretty well. I have used a snore hook a bit, and I found that hardware on that to be a bit clunky. It is, uh, but you know, it's just me. No, it's not you. It's not you. It's funky. Well, John, the the most ridiculous one, like I said, with the trough is this Z quiet. It's uh, advertised, you know, it'll stop your snoring. It's just a trough. It doesn't even have right. any way right. to fit the T. That's ridiculous. I have right. used the uh, uh, a uh, the uh, the uh, uh, I forget the blue uh, blue pro. Right. But can you give me some feedback on that? Well, that I've used it for three times. I picked it up at ADSM. Uh, can't remember which meeting it was three three meetings ago, or whatever. I picked up a couple of them uh, to use as an interim appliance, and it doesn't have anything that sticks out in the front, which is right. which right. is what what you know the, the tap is uh, got that thing sticking out. I don't know how people can stand it uh, for very long. It's sort of like uh, you know the apnea guard, that little thing sticking out there all the time. <laughs> But at any rate, yeah, the, the Lupro's got a ratchet device in the bottom, and it's thermocryl. You you know, put it at the top and bottom, 
and it's adjustable forward and you can actually kind of move it you know left or right if the person wasn't wasn't uh centered up uh, but of course that's the problem is that they can't move around nobody knows where that center is depending on how far out you are but uh but it if but it was effective uh you know as an interim appliance it worked out pretty good um uh, you know the patients would wear it and they i guess some complaints i got was that you know they couldn't move the, the jaw around if they were doing that but but it was uh pretty effective for what it was used for if you haven't seen one of those is there's no lateral movement allowed at all right right it's so like a monoblock no really yeah, an adjustable yeah, monoblock yeah adjustable yeah monoblock. basically basically you know. but, I, but the question but so the question is again here what we're seeing here is a blended thing of where we are thinking about over the counter and that's something where there's really i mean there's no nobody knows even what they're doing with it and it's like snoring and then you have some of these other interim uh devices that are somewhat customized because you put it on their teeth so there's a kind of a blur in between there and i agree with barry so here you got you can treat snoring with these things but but we know darn well that you may not be treating you might be just hiding something with them and that's i'm with barry on that how you can how the fda can approve treating star when we know that that's only you know kind of like the little tip of the iceberg this it's worse in canada Okay, than what you guys have it in the States, because oral appliances to manage sleep apnea are not a controlled act. So we have the insurers putting them in. You can buy them at the drugstore. It'll say right on it, FDA approved to treat mild to moderate sleep apnea. Patients can buy them right over the counter. So we're not even talking purchasing them to, to manage snoring. We're talking in purchasing, purchasing something off the shelf in a drugstore to manage sleep apnea. And that's allowed in Canada because it's well, not a controlled act. You you would think that would be one legal can of worms for if it was down here in the states, the attorneys would be all over like like yeah. a, like you know what on you know what. Yeah, it's been first, it's been first, like that first, since first. the nineties, and it's terrible. But that's that's the world we live in. You know what's surprising, Jim? Yeah. What's surprising is that you would think that, but it doesn't happen. Yeah. So so uh, I wouldn't ever want to depend on our justice system. No, with our no. current level of attorneys to help us regulate uh, good medical care. But having said that, uh, there's none of that. I don't know of a dentist. You know, it's, I, I've gone to many lectures and listened to what's his name, what's his name, whatever his name. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm never politically correct, so bear with me. But what's the guy's, the, the lawyer's name who does all the lecturing? Ken Burley. Oh, sorry? Ken Burley. Ken Burley. Burley. There's there's and no, I, I listened to him threaten, you know, all the the people that are going to get sued and the horrible things you do and whatnot. And the reality is, is that that all all the people I've taught, all the people I've worked with, all the authors I've worked with, all the things, all the horrible things I've seen, um, uh, people do. Uh, I've I've seen none of that. So I, I I would like to think that would that that that, that might help uh, con the concern about quality care. I just find it while we're having this discussion, isn't it really hysterical that when we think about the discussion last week from uh, John Remmers about how essential it was to, to understand not only whether an oral appliance uh, might be, might be uh, 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 effective and the patient may be a responder, but also you need to know exactly or approximately where that posture is before you start. And now we're talking about a whole bunch of people going and buying a Zipa because it's a hybrid and it holds your tongue down, uh, though there's never been any significant no no study to show that that's helpful, uh, and 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 going on and then reporting their success because they stopped snoring. It's mind-boggling how screwed up and what a wild wild west we live in, and it's just up to us to decide what level yeah. of care that we're comfortable with. Yeah, that, that pretty think, well represents both ends of the spectrum, doesn't it, Perry? I mean, you're talking about the absolute ultimate test that not only will tell you it works, but what range where you need to be, as opposed to as anecdotal as, well, I'm not snoring, it's working great. Yeah. Jim, what you were going to say? Jim was going to say, okay, yeah, Jim. Yeah, I, I was going to say that uh, uh, I think we're probably a little bit under the radar here in a way because this whole thing is relatively 
new and and we're in the in the thing of treating medical stuff and and uh, but we're dentists and we're and we're d uh, you know we're durable medical equipment not treating uh you know it's like a wheelchair or something but but and so i think that's why it hasn't hit it but if you recall in dentistry years you know the uh, attorneys were when they started suing people for failure to diagnose and treat periodontal disease all of a sudden i mean i can remember uh, seeing patients with ab- total <laughs> perio problems, and their dentist never said a, a word about it, but boy, they sure do now. Yeah, well, yeah. I, exactly. But but you just took, then that's, a, Jim, it's a great point. But what's what distinguishes the two? One is dentistry within dentistry, and the yes. other is dentistry within medicine. Yep, that's my point. We, are dealing, we, we as dentists have joined an already screwed up, broken system. And we didn't help it. We, no. made it. we made it, we took our dental myths with us and made, made it worse. DME, that's well, the problem. Well, the fact that the AADSM allowed us to become technicians. Agreed, agreed. And forced us to become technicians uh, uh, gives us some sort of protection and at the same time screwed those of us who want to provide good care in a coordinated fashion with a profession. Hopefully they'll, <laughs> I don't know if you can put the horse back in the barn, but but hopefully uh, there'd be more and more emphasis on more treating a medical condition and that that's what we're part of as opposed to you know, polishing a crown or some damn thing. I don't know, I've got enough of that. <laughs> it's gonna take okay, a while. John. Yeah, it's going to take a while. Physicians uh, still have, a, uh, many physicians still have a hard time with dentists working in this arena of sleep disorders and airway and stuff like that. Um, when we have, you know, our hygienists come to the programs and, and hear about, you know, uh, the children and what we should be looking for and, and you know, maybe sending some high risk children off to the ENTs for a, a referral. Well, they can't get to uh, an ENT without a referral from the family physician in Ontario, and you know, and what you know, they hear back all too often is, "Tell the dentist to mind their own business," or you know, "Fix teeth." Or I mean, they, they, there's this resistance, you know, to to um, um, us us getting involved that is still there. And I'm talking that's current, even still going on right now. I can't imagine it's different in the states that we, we experience that here in Ontario. So. Tongue retaining device. I, you know, we can't not at least mention this. And I can tell you how much time I spend thinking about tongue retaining devices, and it's this, the number is so small, it's not even on a scale. However, uh, what do we know? Uh, TRDs are effective for mild to moderate OSA and sometimes for severe OSA. This was uh, published in uh, 2002. Um, TRD performance similar to uh, mandibular advancement devices, 2009. And in this meta analysis, looking at a number, of different uh, studies. TRDs reduce HI, ODI, ESS, effective alternative for OSA. Now there's gonna be situations that come up where we just can't use a particular advancement device. And we all know, uh, you know what those situations are. They don't have any mandibular teeth and they can't afford a, um, uh, implants to, to hold a, a, a denture in place. You know, they're, they're not gonna be wearing, unless there's somebody that's got new information for me. On, online today. There isn't a mandibular advancement device you can use. So what do we do for these people? Send them away and say, well, I can't help you or put a tongue retaining device in their mouth. So I, I have a story, to, a story to share with you folks, but yourselves, is there any, any experience with TRDs in your practice no. and, and how it saved the day or, or not? S- Okay, I, I see Alex came on. You, you, Alex, you gonna talk? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so here's the question. How many of us that are visible or, or vocal have ever used a tongue retainer device? Never. I have. John, John. Never bear. Never, Rick, never. Uh, I had. One patient that uh, was going through a, a, a situation where um, he couldn't use uh, a device, and I and I said, okay, we, I have something here that 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 
that might help you. And and I, I got one for him. And two days later, he called me up and he said, you've got to be kidding me. I could nowhere wear this thing. And I, I guess it would hold your tongue forward, but uh, I think you'd have to be a committed <laughs> patient to probably deal with it for very long. But that's the only one I ever did. So has anyone ever spoken to at any time, any length of time, or got an opportunity to sit uh, and and have lunch with Michael Alvarez? Yes, I have. Uh, Mike's right near me. He's a good friend. So Michael, Michael is probably, I think, Jim, the most experienced person with tongue retainers device in, devices in the country. Uh, Michael, uh, as of ten years ago, when I knew him. Um, Michael was, and did you know that? Did you know he was using a lot of them, a lot of TRDs? No, I didn't. I knew he was, uh, uh, you know, he developed with the EMA early on. He, he does a lot of modifications with it, whatever. It's not, not a device I like, but, but he's very good with it. I mean, he's a very knowledgeable guy. I've learned a lot from him, but I wasn't aware that he was messing with the tongue root. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, at that point, I know that may have changed. And and uh, I've spent some time with him because there were some indications. Well, I had some, uh, at that point, some indications. Uh, one of the indications we had at that point was I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable with any appliance with a, with a, even with a, with a, with a full upper denture. Uh, that's changed. And we'll, when we get there, we'll talk about that. So, so therefore there were, a, a, I saw a lot of uh, applications for it. Uh, I've tried it like you, Jim, on two patients, and uh, I, I think it's my management uh, skills uh, were lacking when it came to it. My experience was lacking, and I was unable to help the patients uh, uh, stick their tongue and make them swell into the bulb. <laughs> <laughs> um, they didn't use it for something else, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's that's worse than swearing. I just want to say. <laughs> yeah. Got a visual there. I don't know if I want that visual. Okay. So what I can share with you is this. I mean, honestly, I, you know, I've been doing this since like 97, 96, and I think I've delivered maybe five or six tongue retaining devices in that whole time, right? So that shows you how often this comes up. Uh, but there's going to be those situations, and perhaps it's the mix of patients I get. I don't know. Um, most people that come to me have teeth, you know, that are solid enough that I can pick an appliance that I think will do the job for them. But I had this case just last year, and I could pull up the slides later on when we're on a different part of the conversation to show you the statistics if you want. But, you know, um, she came in, uh, maybe perhaps around 40-ish, a lady, and uh, she had an upper and lower denture, missing a lot of teeth. Uh, the remaining teeth were periodontally iffy, right? So really I felt that she had enough teeth that I could put a mandibular advancement device on there. But I also felt pretty certain that I would reduce the lifespan of those teeth by putting them in mandibular advancement devices, or the chances were likely that I would be doing that. So, you know, I could get away with making an appliance, and in many offices, that's probably what would have happened. But, you know, she would have then lost those teeth, considering the history and considering the periodontal status of those teeth, she would have lost those teeth sooner than if I had not done the MAD. So I, I expressed this concern to her and I, I showed her a, a TRD and she says, well, sure, let's try that. She took it home, came back, said, oh, I've been wearing it. I feel great. It's great. Let's do a Nox T3. And so I have the Nox T3 a home sleep test showing that it, it works fabulous. Um, she said to me on the spot when she came back and got verification that it worked that can I buy a second one to keep at my cottage so I don't have to worry about bringing them back and forth? Now, of course, I mean, it's a, it's not a lot of money relative to a custom-made steep appliance, so it was easy for her to actually make that request. But nevertheless, we go from like something you hardly ever make, the situation comes up, and I mean, for me, it's, well, let's try. You know, it's, it, it, it wasn't really a lot of money to throw you know, at it. And it turned out to work out fabulously for her. And it made me question myself that maybe this is something that I should be turning to more often. I don't know. Because obviously the go-to is, you know, some type of mandibular advancement device. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there as something, a tool that, you know, I think we should have an armamentarium. And when that patient presents that they're just not a candidate for a mandibular advancement device, 
you're losing very little by actually trying a TRD because they're not expensive. And they, you know, like there's different different brands out there. Um, I like the the Avio TSD, but there's different brands out there, and they usually come like in a small, medium, and large, and uh, and you go from there. But anyway, so anything else about uh, tongue retaining devices? Yes, Alex. You are not able to get them in Europe. You're not. No. No not chance. Even over the, not order even over the internet, Europe, because no. I I understand that uh, in North America they could be ordered over the internet. Uh, from from these Chinese companies for like very little money, so I'm just wondering maybe over the internet you could actually order some into your practice. Maybe yeah. Uh, I don't know. So anyway, well, wait a second. Yeah. If, if they're not available in Germany for a reason, they are not available in Europe. Well, I thought Germany was in Europe. Yes, Germany is a little part of Europe. So, uh, which state are you in in, in the U.S.? Uh, a state of panic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in I'm in Pennsylvania. So, uh, yeah, do you know where that is? It, it's a little part of the U.S. And if you don't get something in the U.S., it's the, the same, uh, you're living in Germany, you can't get anything in Europe. So, uh, yeah. So, well, it, it, I would know, out, if, if you can't get, if it's not available, I'm wondering if it, and I, you've expressed some concerns about your regulations and about what's, what, what you can and cannot do and your, your patterns of practice there, which are a little upsetting to us in terms of, you know, it's how backwards it is. So uh, I'm wondering if that the last thing you want to do is get into any kind of regulatory difficulty by doing something that isn't considered uh, 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 appropriate care. I, I would. That's, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought, of, Barry. Absolutely. I'm wondering, Alex, does your organization have any guidelines on tongue retaining devices at all? No. No statements. No. Interesting. Interesting. See, that didn't even occur to me, Barry. I think that's very important. I, it didn't even occur to me because the tongue retaining devices were here since the mid 80s. I mean, they, you know, really, you know, where we're talking pre any adjustable or even non adjustable oral appliances. So um, I'm surprised that there's no discussion about its potential use and utility, even in your, even in your literature, Alex, that, that comes out of Germany. Because there certainly is in the literature coming out of North America. Sure, you can you can uh, cite the articles of Cartwright and uh, yeah, but there is no lab offering uh, TRD. Interesting. Yeah, Cartwright's uh, Cartwright's work in the in the mid '80s was with a TRD. Yeah. Started with a TRD. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned the lab. I mean, I, there's probably very few labs, if any, in North America now that will provide a custom-made TRD. There probably is. I just don't know of any, um, because everybody that is actually using it at the odd time, like I've just mentioned, is using something over the counter, right? You know, so there there used to be a time where you know we talked about compression taking protocols and all this stuff to get them the lab to make them, and then then it, it slow, slow, that part of it slowly died, and it went to well, if you're going to use a TRD, there's these available over you know over over the counter out of a box, you know. So okay, I I have one one question yes. Group yes. On, on that. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but I seem to remember that the Avio TRD device they um, had on their website that the material they use is approved in some manner than some of the others that are over the counter. I don't know if that's FDA approval. I don't recall that. Uh, uh, probably some sort of manufacturing um, uh, quality that they tout that others may maybe don't. Um, uh, anybody know anything about that? Uh, so uh, are uh, we talking about FDA status, like approval? No, I, I, just, I just remember them saying that they had a material that, uh, not that the appliance was any more effective than any of the other TRD appliances, but the material itself was safer to yeah. use in early. Uh, and, and John, I'm trying to think of what it is because we, we they went through the same thing with um, 
with uh, NTIs, with the polycarbonates in the NTIs, and they had a, 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 a potentially carcinogenic uh, atom uh, that was dis disconcerting and that they had a, that Jim Boyd had to go through and, and re and reestablish with his with his uh, um, with his with their manufacturers, and and there were I you got somebody knows what that what the what 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 it was. No, I don't I don't remember. I can look it up. Um, what it was that was a uh, concern. Um, so I'm not surprised that, that someone suggesting that that one of the one of the TRDs, the Avo, for example, doesn't have that. It was a some sort of uh, 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 molecule. I will check it. Now, of course, you know, we know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, there's there's websites from China where you can go order these TRDs, actually very inexpensive. But w once again, if it's coming from a source that is not based in, you know, North America, then you, you just don't have guarantees about the, the material that the appliance is made out of, you know, never mind the quality of the appliance itself. But that's just one of the dangers of ordering stuff over the Internet. So, Does it matter in which material the tongue is swelling? It swells. I'm sorry? Yes, it does, but in which material? Yeah, does but it that's matter? better because it will retain better then. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> we just want to cause enough for the cities and the bulb, right? Okay. You, you know your appliance is working if you can't talk in the morning. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Your okay, so now we're going we're gonna to move on to um, mandibular advancement devices. These are the, the appliances, the types of appliances we're more accustomed to thinking about um, in, our, in our daily lives in dental sleep medicine. And I, I've broken them down into certain categories. Um, I, like to, I like to speak about appliances in this way because when you think about a category, then you can see all the appliances that fall into that category. And just, you know, in a moment, whenever you pick up an appliance, you know what category falls in and then what the implications of using that particular appliance are. So start off, the, the, the two broad categories are attached at the side or they're attached anteriorly, okay? And then um, the side ones are either two movable components, upper and lower, or they're like a mono block, but they're adjustable, right? And then, of course, the ones that are attached anteriorly um, are um, uh, all by block, uh, two components. Now, all of them then are broken down a step further where the lower jaw is either being pushed forward or it's being pulled forward. So you either have a compression force or traction force going forward, okay? So that's how things are categorized. So the first group basically attached bilaterally right on the sides and it can either be bi block or mono block and so the bi block ones there's either an oblique compression downward and forward or oblique traction upward and forward or horizontal traction along the occlusal plane going forward okay and then we have the mono block which are fixed but adjustable right and this is horizontal compression being pushed forward okay so the first one then is the bilateral attached at the sides by block and you can see the force vector is downward and forward so um, you can you can see from the pictures on the top there the suad the herps I put the clear way in this category although it's more of a mono block than a by block it has this same force vector and then of course the pH uh, the prosomnus herps or any other herps like uh, product. So there's probably people on today that have had a lot of experience with the herps like appliances. So, you know, this is an opportunity to jump on and tell us, you know, what you like about it, what to watch for, caveats, and, and so forth. I mean, those of you in the U.S. considering that this is PDAC approved, you know, will be making a lot of these. There's some practices that uh, make almost exclusively the herbs appliance in the, in the states for that reason. Well, it's 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 it is interesting uh, when we look at um, uh, appliances like the Oasis and the Prosomnus, 
uh, which has absolutely nothing, no connection to Herbst at all. And yet now they have their own Herbst version and they have the own Herbst version because they needed a PDAC approval. So, right. so it's as though, you know, they, 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 everyone loves their style and loves their appliance and claims that they've got the best appliance. And then when they have to use their materials for the, keep this in mind, every, every appliance has two portions to it. It has what we call the vehicle and the active ingredient. The vehicle is that part which holds it onto the teeth. The active ingredient is what creates the action. And dentists for years have been arguing over, over, the, over, the, over the vehicle, which vehicle is best. And why does that even matter? What is its action? How does that matter? Now, how the vehicle does is responsible for transmitting some forces to the teeth. So it can, it's not that it can't matter, it can matter. So uh, I just found it so interesting that, that these appliance companies, Oasis and for some of us are, you know, very, very specific about how good their particular appliance design is. And yet in order to, to, to make it work, then create, uh, and that's not negative, but just keep this in mind. Now go ahead and create a, uh, um, a Herx version, which uses their vehicle with a Herx active ingredient. Agreed, Barry. Um, there are some uh, of these people that actually have uh, put enhancements on that Herx design that I think are worthy of mention. Like, for instance, on the Oasis, her farm, it can be adjusted by putting a tool in, in intraorally from the front, and you adjust it by turning it over the screwdriver on both sides, so it can be adjusted while it's in the mouth, as opposed to, we know that the SUVAD and the customary herbs appliances, you have to take out of the mouth to, to adjust, right? And so that's, that's one thing that's a little different with the Oasis one. And the other uh, one that is different is, is the pH, the prosomus herbs, because um, by nature, the fact that it's a CAD CAM milled uh, acrylic methyl methacrylate, you know, it's much smaller in size. And they've actually, you know, come up with an arm that's bent and, and it goes along the, the profile of the appliance nicely, and they built in little acrylic bumpers so that that you know um, um, uh, propulsion mechanism on the side that's pushing the jaw forward is actually a smoother experience to the cheek than what we typically have with the Herbst appliances. So you know these are in, enhancements with specific you know um, versions of the Herbst that are are kind of nice. But you're right. The reason that the only reason they went that way is so that they could have an offering that was covered by by, by Medicare. And that, that's not a negative. Yeah. That's just that's just a, a fact, and it's great. It's not a problem. But it's, it, so my question is, and because I'm not a Herbst user, did that improvement resolve a problem that we actually had? Barry, uh, <laughs> as far as the as far as the Oasis uh, uh, arm, the only reason why they really did that was because under because of the Herbst for for Medicare requires uh, not only that form but also if you, the fine print is that the patient should be able to adjust it in their mouth and so by able to do it i.e. the patient could then be doing it themselves from the front which means they're capable of also screwing the thing up completely <laughs> and, and but that nobody would uh, figure that out you know that somebody's i mean they have a hard enough time so now they're going to supposed to get this in there and see that they moved it like one tenth of one millimeter you know they're going to screw it up for sure but that's the reason why they put it with that they use that particular uh, adaptation and it doesn't change the function of of the appliance itself so i didn't realize that mark you're telling me that they that the 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 requirement for PDAC was that it be able to be adjusted with a with it in the mouth. Yes. Oh, then, then how are all the other herbs appliances uh, covered? Then I don't understand. Get back to you when I get information. Well, that's you know, people probably put them in regardless, but because I mean they they don't they're not going to go check on it, but that's what it says. You know, it has to be uh, able to be adjustable by the patient. Uh, Barry and, and, uh, can I check in here? This is Mark Abramson. How are you guys doing? Hey, Mark. Uh, great. Great time hey. for you to jump on. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I had two conversations with uh, the head of Medicare who created that requirement. Uh, they were both hour and a half conversations. I think he has more, it's, it, his name is Dr. Helms. Uh, and uh, the first time he explained to me that Medicare was deciding on covering oral appliance therapy. What happened, they started in the 1990s and they got from Great Lakes Laboratory a herps appliance. Mm -hmm. And he claimed that his big charge, and he was so proud of this, was to separate orthodontic appliances from sleep apnea and medical devices. So he looked at it without any knowledge and said, oh, this is, has a hinge on it and it's joined. And that's where those words came out. So that's what they put in and approved for Medicare hinged and joined requirement. It has nothing to do with anything in literature. I think I totally agree with Bar what Barry's saying. Uh, mandibular advancement is mandibular advancement. Uh, and, and uh, you know, at the time they had that uh, shoe, shoe herbs hinge that was very difficult for any Medicare patient to get that little pin in and turn it 16 quarter turns. So you're making the most difficult adjustment mechanism for elderly patients. Then the second time I talked to him, he said he was going to stop paying for Medicare oral appliances, but they already had this rule in effect because it's a government thing. So they left it instead of updating it. So I explained to him, I said, this is the equivalent of you saying you want to distinguish a computer from a typewriter. And in 1990, you write down, well, it has to have a big floppy disk in order to be a <laughs> Medicare computer. And none of our computers would qualify today because we don't have a big floppy disk. And instead of updating that and saying technologies has changed and and we, we now have, you know, new, better systems, let's, you, let's provide these for the care of these people who need it. Uh, we're stuck in this. I, I, I have to say, I have to say, sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting, Mark, but this analogy coming from somebody that grew up around the corner from Steve Jobs. I just had yes. to say that. Yes, I know. My brother-in-law was in charge of the Lisa project. <laughs> he invented cut, copy, paste. Um, so yeah, I know. And, and I wanted to bang my head against the wall after I spoke to him. I mean, it was so ridiculous. It made no sense. I'm not an anti-government person. I, you know, they can do wonderful things for us, but this is government at its worst. And they refuse to, to budge on this stupid rule. So what all the product people had to do is they had to come up with a, something that was hinged and joined. And what I did is I looked at the, the hinge itself and I said that I think we, I can come up with a more user-friendly, better uh, hinge because I didn't use the herbs either. And I found that the, it had to be in the corner of the lip, which right at the bicularis oris, and, and, and it hurt and it was pro, poking into the, to, to, uh, the lower lip. And being further back would be better and easier to adjust. So I, I worked on this for three years to come up with that hinge. And uh, to be honest with you, it's it's been a big thing. People really like it, and and it's it's selling well. But I and and as long as they keep this stupid rule in, in here, I guess it it helps me. But I don't want this isn't the way I want help. I I want to see what's best for the patients to be able. So understanding why manufacturers have gone to this is just basically because that's the only way that we could provide appliances for Medicare. And we had to fit that stupid requirement that has no scientific basis at all. So, so the rumor that I had heard, Mark, which is fascinating, was that that, that which is different than your story, and uh, was that Keith played had played a role in that because he was attached in the front and he was hinged, and that and that that that's where that came from. That that it was his indication to them that this was more effective and 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 uh, what would be required for uh, for Medicare. So I'm that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, uh, but that's not what he he did not say anything uh, to that nature. And originally the uh, tap was didn't qualify because it could be unhinged. Right. And that's where they went to this system they have now where it basically, they made one that basically would, couldn't unhinge. To, the the to, double bar, which is fascinating because then they ran into a problem with the, with the dream tap because it was unhinging. And then yeah. they had to change that again 
uh, specific for Medicare. We'll get there when we talk about the tap. It's yeah. So well, anyway, that that hinge is easier to adjust for the uh, for the practitioner and for a reasonably uh, capable uh, patient. Uh, it's pretty easy for them to adjust that particular hinge as well. Out of the mouth. With the the Oasis the Allen wrench. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, it's two turns is a millimeter, and uh, you know you have a full range of ten millimeters in either direction. Plus, the it's in the bicuspid area rather than in the canine areas at, at the anterior. It's also parallel to the arch. Yeah. yeah that's what I was going to ask you, Mark. So it is unlike the the angle that you see here with the traditional herps. Correct. Uh, yours is a, a parallel to the obtusal plane. Correct. So the force vectors would be different than this. Correct. Now, with, with this style of herps, I'm sure everybody realizes and, and uses elastics to help prevent jaw opening when the patient's sleeping supine. Do you find that that is as necessary with your design of, of the arm? Yeah, it's, it's no, that's no different. And, I've, you know, the elastics, they still, they, you know, those rubber bands aren't really going to hold the jaw shut. And I, I find that, like, like the difference between the traditional oasis, which has the shield in front, that even if their lips open, they're actually sealed. Um, I find, plus the nasal dilation, I find that that's much better to prevent mouth breathing. Any of the sep any of the appliances that separate, even with the little rubber band, they're they're going to go to mouth breathing. Uh, you know, it's it's not going to restrict them. It's that that rubber band isn't strong enough. But we do use it. I, I just want to I just want to say in, in for everyone that um, there aren't very many people who have gone through and done and made the made the uh, made the investment in time and caring and love uh, for the for for the sake of science uh, that uh, Mark Abramson has. And that we are very very fortunate in our profession. Whether it it it's things that the, what he's done with his appliance. Was always with a with the right intent, and and he entered a field that he had no intention of entering, <laughs> and has been involved in it for a longer time than he ever wanted to be. Uh, uh, but it, unlike a, a company, a pro, some is, and there's not negative about anybody. The fact is, it's Mark that does this, and uh, Mark. Mark, yeah, you deserve a one hell of a lot of credit, and I guarantee you that he's very busy these past few days because the weeks because there's no one in the country that is as good as dealing with uh, anxiety and stress uh, as Mark, and I'm sure that uh, you're spending a lot of time on the telephone and on on Zoom uh, these these past few weeks. Yeah, I've I've done a lot of webinars. It's a it's a stress reduction is a growth industry. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Mark, thanks so much for joining in. That was very timely. And you know we're going to be speaking about the Oasis a little bit later on. Um, is there any anything else we want to share about the herps? What about um, important teeth? That um, is there any teeth that are critical? Any teeth that don't matter? <laughs> so that we can have that within the session? So for instance, if you're missing mandibular posterior teeth, is it an issue? Well, yeah, you know, as as in any appliance, you you've got to have uh, locking on on the mandible. I mean, the the Oasis, as Barry as Barry pointed out many years ago, uh, we we do a lot of those with upper dentures, and but you need the mandible, you need locked in. So the more teeth you have, the more you know, the more secure it is. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if, you know, obviously you want molars because it's it's better attachment and more roots. Uh, but if you had, if you were missing molars and, and you had bicuspids on forward, you know, I, I don't think it would make any difference. Uh, you're still holding the mandible, mandible forward and you still, uh, you know, have the force, same forces on the teeth pretty much with any appliance, I would say. Would you agree with that, Barry? Well... More, more than you can possibly imagine. I, 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 I always get a kick out of um, uh, many of these discussions where, uh, and that's not happening here, uh, but I've been on these seminars or lectures where people are talking about uh, how they choose their appliances. And so much of it's, it's just crap. So much of it's just 
just you know they're literally making up rules to try to help people guide and and take the stance that you need eight or nine appliances so that you 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 can fill all the voids and you and I both know there isn't much you can't do if if you decide that Oasis is your go-to appliance you can use it almost 90% of the time uh, right. if you decide that tap is your go-to appliance you can use it 90% of the time if you decide that Prostomus is your go-to appliance so so it and and it's I understand that 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 one of the things that, that people try to try to determine is force vectors and its effect on teeth. And if, if people understood how complicated force vectors really were and how impossible it really was to determine what, how those teeth were going to respond to a particular appliance based upon when those teeth are together during parafunction. It's, it's, just, it's just massive. So, so just I would love to tell our profession to stop making stuff up. Just stop making it up. Get good. Find a, a really good quality appliance and use it. And, and then, and then when you know, uh, uh, and you know, what you want it, you want it to do all the things you want it to do. Be comfortable, whatnot. Uh, 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 not have a, in some cases, a smaller footprint if it's possible. Whatever it is that that, that particular patient may need. But for the most part, uh, the, some of the rules that I hear about why you choose an appliance. Uh, are really, it's like they, somebody sat in their living room and figured this all out and made it all up. Okay. So I there totally for the leader and two guys that I absolutely adore and respect, Barry and Mark, okay? And so let me throw something out there. And so maybe this is made up stuff, but that's what, that's what the forum allows for, the evidence and, you know, what, 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 what we think anecdotally and empirically, right? So this shows some force vectors here. Let's think about this for a second, okay? It's, it's ridiculous to think that they're not going to be forces subjected to the dentition if your jaw's forward and there's going to be some level of parafunction in everybody's mouth, varying degrees. So there's going to be some level of forces transmitted. Otherwise, we wouldn't have tooth movement. Wouldn't happen. But we can't cheat physics and we can't pretend any one appliance is going to stop it from happening and, 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 and the rules of physics apply to all of the appliances. So let's just think about this for a moment. We're all looking at a picture here, side view, right? The connectors are at the top and the back and at the bottom and the front. And there is a study out there, don't have it on this slide, um, that shows that the type of tooth movement associated with this particular design of appliance is protrusion and intrusion of the lower superior teeth and retrusion and intrusion of the, of the posterior maxillary teeth. So if, if you look at the force vectors, you think, well, that kind of makes sense, right? It's going to sort of push the upper teeth backward and inward and the lower teeth downward and inward into the bone. And that's a, exactly what they showed in that particular study. So there's not really been a lot of good research done, appliance by appliance, on what happens with the force vectors. But there's been a lot of good research done in dentistry and orthodontics. That's where the whole field of orthodontics came from. We all know from ortho 101, if we put force on a tooth, the tooth is gonna move. And, and so if it's a little bit of force, it's gonna take longer. If it's a lot of force, it's gonna be quicker and perhaps more destructive. And so you know, we can't pretend that these things don't exist, right? So if you're looking at a picture like this, showing you where the attachments are, would it be more critical or less critical if you were missing molars on the upper as opposed to the lower in this particular design appliance. If you think about where the attachment is, I, I'm going to answer it's a rhetorical question. Clearly, if, 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 if the connectors are right on the side of the upper molars, you'd think having some good solid dentition there, right, that is going to be subjected to those forces would be a good thing. I can't see it being a bad thing. And on the bottom, if you're missing mandibular molars, perhaps it's pretty well insignificant, as long as there's enough dentition in the rest of the arch on the bottom to support the load of, 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 of those force vectors, whatever those force vectors are. And it's going to be unique to a specific patient, depending on the amount of parafunction and so forth. Okay? Um, and, and so what I'm going to suggest here, this will all due respect to everything Barry said and Mark said, I'm going to suggest there that wherever the connectors are, the teeth immediately underneath those connectors are perhaps the most critical 
for uh, the, the need to be nice and strong and sturdy to be able to support whatever forces. And the further away you get from those connectors, wherever they are, the less important it becomes. I'm just going to throw that out as a suggestion, just something to think about, because nobody really knows the answer. So I'm going to I'm going to tell you why the answer that nobody knows is still suggests that what you've said doesn't make much sense, and that is because you are looking at a mechanical model. You are look, if you look back in 1979, if you look at Highlander's study, what you found was uh, he did work on a dry skull and he showed uh, that, that the further posterior the contact was, uh, the greater the, uh, the forces were on, on the condyle. And we know now that that, that, that that isn't the case. And that when, when, we, when you more recent studies demonstrate that, 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 the, that the mechanical model without in, 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 in vitro uh, really missed a lot of information. The, the forces here are, everything is so modified by where those, where that, the contact between those appliances are to a, the, this context a touch to assume that all of the forces are occurring only where the attachments are, I think is potentially Polonius. I understand the logic, but I, I'm not sure. Don, I will make comment on that. <laughs> I don't know, Barry. You know, yes. But how often is the patient clenched on the device? Exactly. So, you know, how much of it is just retrusive action? You know, how much is, is elevator activity? I don't know even how to figure that. Exactly. That's my exactly. point. But the thing is, we don't know. But to pretend that the, there's no forces. No, one, no one's pretending there's no forces, right. but I'm, I'm not going to make them up. That's all I'm saying. No, no, no. But nobody's making forces up. What I'm suggesting is for retention, right? You need to have, you, you know, good, good dentition where those connectors are. And where the connectors are not, it's not that critical, even if the teeth are missing. Right. I so, don't know that that's true, if, but if that's true, if you, if from your experience you found that to be the case, I, I, I never used a herb, so I, I don't know. Right. Uh, no, I think this applies to look at you. You would, you've made many, many, many taps. You would not be putting a tap in for somebody that has weak anterior teeth, would you? I mean, from eye tooth to eye tooth, like you know, like not lost them all in a in a hockey accident. You, you wouldn't you probably time. wouldn't be using that tap for that person. Do it all the time. Yeah, I agree. Really? You don't go it all. You're still going to have the every forces. working day, John. <laughs> every working day, interesting. So yeah, you wouldn't go to a, a, a dorsal appliance uh, in that particular case and get a, get the forces away from the anterior teeth where there weren't any. No. Interesting. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about the teeth where there weren't any. And in fact, if there are mobile anterior teeth, that is not in my mind, believe it or not, a contraindication for for that appliance, just like it is in the contraindication for for an oasis, even though an oasis is on that is on that. In fact. It's not even a contraindication for an anterior midpoint stop. If I, if Mark knows, whenever I used an Oasis, I used an anterior midpoint stop. I, I think I was the one, may have been the one that encouraged Mark to, to make that as an option. Absolutely. And, 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 and people go, well, you're going to pound these anterior teeth. Well, if you look at the Wellhouse study and you look at it, you're not. And, and if the forces are in the long axis of those teeth, no matter how mobile they are, you, you, you're not putting them at risk. So, so uh, there are some, that's what I'm saying, there are some generalized assumptions that people make that are, that I think are, we make, sometimes make things more difficult for ourselves because we overthink. That's all well, I'm saying. And we the, want to think. I, what, what my thinking was in, in looking at the, the appliances, I, I really focus on slip joints. In other words, the mandible's going to move. It's going to move laterally. We're moving it forward and holding it forward, but it's going to move laterally. It's going to have a tendency to open. So anytime that you have something that is going to grab or hit, it's going to, those forces are going to be translated into the teeth because they're held onto the teeth. So it, it, it's... it's uh, Japan, what they do for earthquakes is they have their buildings on big silicon blocks. And, and when it's the earthquake, the buildings, the earth moves, but it's not translated into the building. 
And, and that's what they do on skyscrapers. And what I designed with the Oasis or with the hinge is enough movement that, that people can move around and, and not be translated into the other arch and onto the teeth. So that's really where the, the forces are more critical is how much force is translated into the dentition itself and how much is allowed to a natural movement that keeps the jaw forward but doesn't that minimizes the translation of the forces into the teeth. Injured. Well, because of the design of your appliance, Mark, yours is the most really the most forgiving because it's not um, it, it's so loosey goosey in the front. You know, uh, if the patient's jaw wants to go to the left, it goes to the left. It allows it to do that. Goes to the right. Goes to the right. And, and if the patient's in pair function, right? There's a big surface area where where that rubbing is going on. You don't have you don't have like a perp's hinge over here that's being challenged right in a certain a, a certain manner, concentrating forces. You, or, you, you, or you manage fin. to distribute the forces very nicely. Right. So you have the fins that don't allow for any lateral movement. So any lateral movement that the patient might try to do is going to be translated from the mandible to the maxilla teeth. So there, there isn't the, the elasticity of lateral movement. So different appliances and different designs have have some sort of restriction in them and we want to minimize that that's all right i'd like to say something about the herbs here that yeah. kind of maybe hasn't been been sort of addressed as much of a contraption as it looks like i've not had a problem with patients wearing it they they seem to get along with it pretty well i haven't had a problem with them getting it titrated correctly because they'll they won't follow the arrows or the buttons or whatever you got on there to mark the screws go different directions depending on the mechanism i've had some troubles with that i'm, I'm not particularly a fan of using hooks on them if you can't get lip closure i, I prefer lip tape because it, by the time you put hooks on it you've changed the, the forces involved in the whole thing um but uh, I, I know it's easy to get kind of stuck on a appliance i get stuck more on features of appliances rather than rather than the appliance because they all have kind of different different mechanisms and forces and stuff which i don't think we really understand which you guys have said you know um so i i, I use herps i know barry says he hasn't i use taps um i think the best appliance is when the patient can wear the works sort of and there's a lot of them that kind of fit that category depending on and who's doing it anyway that's just my two cents worth there yep agreed barry, okay you, barry you'll appreciate this i just got a call to do a stress reduction webinar for my dental society so there you are <laughs> <laughs> can can, uh, can uh, let me know let me know when that is if i can okay. jump in on it. i'd love to do that all right thank you because um, actually i don't really want to but I, I, i'm gonna hook my wife onto that one I was going to say, Barry, Sharon's going to use it a lot more than you, considering she's been alone at home with you for how many weeks now? <laughs> Sorry. He wants, oh. she, wants to, she wants to apply for sainthood. I don't understand. <laughs> we do. So we, here's a bilateral hinge. Um, uh, so attached at the sides, as you can see, a, oblique traction upward and forward. And we can see it's the Emma side of the night. Now the Avant falls into this category also as the, the design of their strap, although it's a different type of strap, the OptiSleep and the Optima. Um, so any thoughts out there for those of you that have been using this style of design? Has anybody had to put elastics on for jaw opening for this style of design? Like the MS type straps. Does anybody place these styles? <laughs> really? Anyone use the Avant? Has anyone done that? That's I have that's not. some. That's some. Final chemo treatment. Sorry. Say again. Whoever said that. Someone said something about chemo treatment. Elaine, if you could unmute yourself. 
Yeah, I think it was uh, Rick Charmore who said, who had a question. Rick Charmore. No, I didn't have a question. No? Okay. okay. Okay, so um, I, I find that, uh, so this, let's be honest with, uh, what's, what's happening, Mark, or anyone? Uh, I was obviously involved with Somnimated in 2007, 2008. Uh, the company's changed so many times and screwed up so many things, but uh, apparently there's some improvement and there is some rave on, the, on Facebook about this particular appliance. I'm not familiar with it. I haven't used it. Uh, I'm not sure what the what the big plus is. Anybody? The Avant? Mark, are you at all familiar with it? I'm not. I just there there seems to be a a uh, more uh, this type of strapping that I've seen in a couple different appliances, but I haven't. I don't have any experience with it. So, so one of the one. How do you feel? How do we feel? Let's let's look at an EMA with with with. Well, those. before we before we leave the Avant, Barry, I can I, I have some feedback on it. Okay, um, great. Because I have been actually wearing one since uh, around December first. So now we're, we're into uh, end of April, right? So I've been wearing one that long, and um, very very comfortable, very small footprint, made out of a, a polymethyl methacrylate milled. With a soft liner, so it's very small footprint, but still has a their their biflex biflex material, which makes it very comfortable on the teeth. Um, their their strap, from best I can tell, it stretches and needs to be replaced, so it's going to have a lifespan. When I talk to them about it, they say no, it doesn't stretch. It has like 0.3 millimeter, you know, a stretch by absorbing uh, 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 fluid, and 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 so that's the, that's really all that. They've, they've disclosed, uh, asked a couple times. Um, but, you know, that's not so much of an issue because it is very, very comfortable to wear. And and uh, if you know that, you know, you have this many months out of a strap and then you replace it, that's no big deal, right? You know, that's a reasonable trade-off. The difference between this and the dorsal design for them is that with the dorsal, as you know, because of the angle of the fin, the jaw drops back when when the jaw opens. Whereas if you this style of strap, the way the the, the, the strap is connected, if the jaw is opening, the jaw is actually moving forward because of the connector at the back is drawing the jaw forward. So in order for it to open, you know the jaw actually moves forward rather than back. So that that's a, a little bit of a I think an upgrade over what would happen with a a simple dorsal appliance. It does come standard with a little hook. Uh, uh, carved out little hooks um, so that you can put elastics on if you want. I don't wear elastics on mine and uh, I've delivered, it's, they've only been available for patients since the middle of January. So I really had literally like six weeks before we were shut down and um, or so. And I think I delivered uh, three or four of them during that time. And everyone that received it uh, was very happy. <laughs> I haven't been in the office since the middle of March. so. I, um, I, uh, I I haven't really seen them on on follow up, but I haven't received any distressing emails or anything like that either. So that's the the little bit I can tell you about the Avant because it's still it's still new in in my hands, right? So two things uh, I, I, let's put up for discussion. Uh, let's talk about the straps and let's talk about the angle of, uh, that you talked about and the, and the coming forward. Um, I know that ProSomnus was proud of their fact that they moved to a 90 percent, 90 degree angle, as opposed to the uh, Sondermet angle, and the claim was that as the jaw opens, it's going to uh, maintain its posture. And I don't know. Uh, I haven't. I, that's a really difficult thing to study, and I don't know that there's been any evidence that that's made any appliance that angle has made the any appliance more effective than another. Uh, and I, so I, I really don't know that there's a, a true clinical advantage other than a mental one that makes us think that it, it's going to hold a position better as though a specific position is going to be physiological, physiologically what's required in every stage of sleep throughout the night. So I, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that that, 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 that matters yet. Uh, I think that's all a theoretical argument that, that without, without any evidence. The other concern I would ha I've always had about the Emma or any straps is if we have determined a posture 
uh, and we know it, the patient stays. What what range is it is it required, and how much stretching does it take before um, we're significantly out of that range? And so, how often should a patient change it? With the EMA, one of the things I've, I one of the reasons I stopped using them early was because patients had all kinds of difficulty. Uh, I had trouble putting the damn straps on around the bulbs. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, so if I was having trouble and my, uh, and, and, and which concerned me because my staff wasn't, but anyway, if I was having trouble <laughs> <laughs> putting them, putting, putting them on, can you imagine, uh, what, what it was like the patients and when should a patient replace them? It wasn't clear to them and, and or to me, uh, in terms of what was required. Yeah. So, uh, I always, I, I I don't know that there's, again, there's no uh, known evidence that an EMA is going to be less uh, satisfactory than, 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 than uh, another appliance that, that's more consistent. It's just, uh, it, it, that, that exp I, I had some concern about that, uh, well, not evidence-based. Yeah, the straps are, in and of itself, besides anything else, just having to uh, have a, a uh, inventory of them and deal with the patients uh, getting them and every that's a pain but the other thing is that uh, uh, JC Goodman one time he says you know the problem is, is there's a, a different amount of protrusion every single night with those things because they're constantly changing and, and uh, you know Tom Morgan has a, a study where one patient he had where it moved one quarter of a millimeter in the patient's breathing uh, uh, it changed, and so with EMA is moving little tiny bits and pieces. The patients have a hard time putting them on, and I I gave up. And it was kind of flimsy. It looks flimsy. It's actually I think they they stay together in terms of the, the acrylic and everything, but but it's kind of a pain. And I don't. That's not. I got to wait. I didn't use them after just a few of them. Now I'll tell you. There's a there's a. Uh... An appliance that I have not had any personal experience on delivering to patients because I just can't wrap my head around doing that. However, uh, when I had one made for myself and I haven't worn it yet, I, I plan on doing that. Be, um, and it's the Silent Night, uh, just for a low-end appliance over the Emma, because you know when you look at the sample Silent Night, it looks like a flim flimsy piece of crap. It really does. It doesn't look like something you ever want to make for a patient. But the actual appliance itself. Is a dual laminate shell, and um, I know when I was talking, Barry, I was talking to Randy Clare um, two weeks ago about, about you know, because he's been wearing a side of night. He says he's had the same straps for the last two years. He hasn't had to replace them, and I told him, you're kidding me. I really have to pull out the one you made for me, and I, I'm going to try this out myself, because he's a heavy Brian uh, um, Bruxer, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me sharing that. And and um, and so you know, if, if it has that type of longevity in his mouth, you know, for when you're looking for an inexpensive solution for someone, this might be something to consider. And that's the Silent Night. And like I said, I'm not speaking from any personal experience at all. This is all new information for me, and I'm going to actually try mine out sometime. But you know, I, I have an Optima that I've been waiting to try out too. And I haven't moved on to it yet, and I'll tell you the reason. Because honestly, I just am enjoying wearing the Avant so much. It's so comfortable. I, I've hesitated every time I'm thinking about, okay, I gotta go try that Optima now and get some first-hand experience with it. I, I just not in the mood to do that because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting such good sleep and it's in the right position for me and, and it's comfortable. So I'm not, I'm not, believe me, that's not a plug for the Avant. I just, I'm just sharing, uh, you know, my, my personal, um, experience there, but the Silent Night. I don't know if anybody else has any experience with it themselves. I, I would, I would like to hear. The vast majority of reports that I've gotten aren't surprising, and that is most dentists, most dentists that I've worked with, that told me about it, talk about how the straps break uh, with 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 bruxing. So, uh, you know, the fact that Randy is a reported bruxer doesn't mean that, therefore, it's Thirty against bruxism, right. uh, and and uh, and th that's always been a problem. My 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 biggest issue with the Silent Night isn't the fact that anything to do with the appliance. It has to do with the patterns of practice that glide well, uh, and they may have changed. But the the selling of of, of appliances to 
uh, to, to untrained dentists who pick an appliance based on its cost with that and then apply it in our in our field without appropriate nearly appropriate training uh, uh, and I, you can't hold a lot responsible for this but the fact that that happens most commonly with this appliance is disconcerting so well, you can get two of them for 300 bucks right <laughs> like a two for one type thing i mean it's, it's so cheap that's that's what's attractive to these dentists that are just want to dabble unfortunately very yeah that's my I, point that's, yeah, yeah. I, I've been working with uh, Glidewell and Randy, and, and fortunately for me, they've selected the Oasis Hinge to, to kind of focus on their appliance. And they're using the silent light more uh, at this point with through Randy, who really knows his stuff. Uh, they're they're using that kind of as a trial appliance, but the long term, they're they're going primary to the Oasis now. With, so uh, they're trying to encourage their silent light users to move to a uh, more custom appliance. Yes. Right. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, Mark, I hear good things. I hear right. sorry, uh, uh, Barry. I hear good things. Um, it's really hard, uh, Barry, uh, sometimes online here to yeah, avoid that. One hundred percent. I just wanted to say, Mark, I really hear good things from uh, from Randy about working with you and, and your appliances, and uh, and it's it's been a good experience all the way around. Hopefully, it's been that way for you too. So right. sorry, Barry. Yeah. No, and, and hopefully, Glide welcomes. I mean. Every every lab took a major hit, obviously, but I don't think any lab, I, if you've ever been to Glidewell, it's probably one of the most impressive things I've ever seen in my life. It is it is damn scary that this 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 lab exists in the world. It's a, it's a, it's its own zip code, and it's it's got uh, well you've seen it, Mark. I mean the the amount of automation that's running 24/7. Their numbers are are just mind-boggling and for it to literally shut down while every lab is affected they don't even know what's going to start working again when they come back uh it, it, it's scary it really is only that they they have i don't know how many buildings but they literally closed and locked up most of the buildings i mean it's crazy yeah it's, it's, yeah they, well, they just bought two more. They just bought. They just put two more buildings. I mean, it, it, it's you do. Yeah, you, so if you haven't been there, you gotta go. It is. It's the most impressive thing. It's scary. It's scary to see the the the, the work uh, uh, pattern. Your office desk. So if you work there and you want a new desk, they have a whole section that just builds their furniture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh no no. If they've got two hundred people in R and D. 200 full-time R&D when they when they send out I mean their 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 marketing is you know it's just scary the numbers that, that he was talking about so before we move on from this design any anything else anybody can share about the Optima and experience there or the OptiSleep CAD so let's, talk, let's talk about OptiSleep so OptiSleep has a a, a second uh, mechanism and anyone familiar with it? So are we familiar with EPAP? Oh, you're talking about Optima. Optima, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you want to address that, John, and what that, and what the? Well, the, so the Optima is an oral breathing channel, and uh, you know, I when I when I saw the titanium versions of this appliance in the last few years, I really didn't have any interest in it at all. I didn't understand how anything that could look like it was going to promote oral breathing, how that could be, you know, desirable. Um, but with the introduction of the Optima, they also introduced a PEEP valve, so positive end expiratory pressure. It's a little valve that slides into that little breathing channel. So if somebody is exhaling out of their mouth, it actually creates that back pressure and helps to maintain uh, the, the pharynx. And um, I thought, wow, okay, now this is interesting. You know, for somebody that's nasally compromised and even they've gone to the ENT, they've done their thing, and they're still nasally compromised, this might be an interesting appliance to have an armamentarium, and I still feel that way. I made the, the first five in Canada when it was as, as a controlled product launch. You know, and, you know, I got, uh, you know, every all five patients accepted it. You know, uh, none of them complained about this little protrusion, you know, coming up between their, their lips. And... Um, 
Two of them are, are using the PP valve and the other three are not. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, at, at that time, it had the Emma straps on it, which I'm not, you know, fond of at all uh, for the reasons we've discussed. But since then, for it to be introduced in the States, which happened this past summer sometime, uh, they needed to have their own proprietary straps. So their proprietary straps are made of a different material. They're not as, I don't know how durable they are as far as stretching goes, because uh, I've not had any personal experience with them yet. But the ones you'll get in the States will not be with the Emma straps, it'll be with uh, their new proprietary straps. Now, what's even more interesting, something they've got in the, in the works right now in RD is something called the One Pack, which is a little device that slides onto the front and actually has nasal, like a nasal pillow mask. All, 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 all one unit, and it's calibratable, and it's actually a PEEP valve for both nasal breathing and oral breathing. So whether the patient's exhaling out of their nose or out of their mouth, it's a controlled exhalation, and, and it can, it's calibratable to the patient. And also, it's not like a straight line. It, it, it basically, it, it, it mimics natural uh, resistance, right? So it, it, it's in development right now, and I don't know when that's going to be on the market, but currently, the Optima, which is the base appliances, of course, both in, in the States and Canada, and the PEEP valve uh, should be, I know it's here, it should be in the States also, the PEEP valve. Or, or they're either that or they're just waiting for their final P, uh, FDA clearance for the States, I'm not sure, for the PEEP valve. Um, and the one path is in development. Okay? And then beyond that, they're also going to be um, developing a connector for a, a PAP mask so that you can uh, basically uh, pop pillow, nasal pillows, you know, attached to the front of, of uh, the appliance so that you can stage it. You can make the, uh, the appliance and then you can move to a peep valve if there still is some help, or you can move to the one pop, or you can actually attach pop. So it's, it's, that's the system and it's completely when, when, when it's all finished. I find it so fascinating, right, that they've decided to go to uh, EPAP with an oral appliance when in fact Provent was essentially a bust uh, in terms of uh, nasal EPEP and um, not found to be very advantageous at all uh, in, in, uh, for, uh, for control. So it's just interesting. I'd be eager to see how the, what the studies look like. They got some good people involved in the research that's happening with this appliance, like Danny Eckert, you know, uh, and so, so I really, you know, I, it looks good, the preliminary stuff that they've put out, you know, but I mean, it's, it's not going to be like the answer to everything. I, I see that as just another tool in, in the armamentarium, right, that m you might be able to fit that to a particular patient when they come in. You know, occasionally you have somebody come in that is so compromised nasally, well, maybe maybe this might be a consideration. Yeah. Okay, so um, the OptiSleep, anybody have any uh, experience with that? This is very few of these appliances made, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's also a CAD CAM. You really need to have a CBCT unit to, and their, their proprietary software in order to actually order it. So I, I don't know many people that make that. So bilateral hinge, this is horizontal traction. You know, we, 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 we know the Narval and its history, um, the, the DSAD, which is, you know, still here, of course, with us. So just like your, your, your herbs arm, um, Mark, this is the horizontal traction coming here. Although your, yours would be a horizontal compression pushing forward, but this is traction pulling forward. So any, any um, thoughts on this appliance? Any information someone wants to share? Anybody using it? Other than John? <laughs> yeah, so I think we established the other day that the group that was on when we talked about different appliances, did we talk about, I can't remember, was it this webinar or another webinar we talked about different appliances? Maybe it wasn't this one. That there wasn't a lot of people um, using the Narvel. Um, Interesting. It was this group that we, we asked that question and there wasn't really a lot of people using the DSAT appliance or, or the Narvel previous to that. Is, so, cost, is cost a major factor, uh, John? What I don't, is it, it's a little more costly than most of the appliances out there, yes? Well, 
if we're talking cost again, in Canadian dollars, right? Okay, the, the cost of a, of a visa in Canadian dollars here is, is say around the 660, 670 mark. And that's approximately the same cost as the Avant appliance. And um, the, the, the Prosomus appliances are actually coming in a little higher than that. I'm talking about in Canada here, yeah. And um, so there is a cost differential between these higher end appliances. And, and I say higher end because they're more expensive compared to say ordering a, a, a tap or, or, or a generic herbs, whatever, which would be down more in like the 480, 490, depending on which appliance you're, you're talking about. You know, because that, that's a substantial uh, difference. So well, I had uh, I had a patient that I did an Arval on, and uh, and uh, we, we came down to a situation where eventually we thought we needed to add some vertical to it, and you can't do it except from a little detachment that Todd Morgan Morgan made up, and and they also stain like crazy. So I gave up on it pretty quick. Plus, it is damn expensive. Uh, but Prosomnus has the same problem of adding vertical to it. So with the Prosomnus, you can add acrylic to their PMMA. It, it would stick. Mark, you, you would you would uh, be familiar being more intimate with the lab. Um, do you know with the PMMA materials, will, will the acrylic stick on a vertical if you want to increase the vertical? Um, I I would assume they would. Um, I'm not. Uh, I, I would I would think that the, they're they're basically polymethyl methacylate. I mean we right. Yeah. So yeah, it would. But, but it's but it's modified. And when I asked them at the lab, they said, "Oh no, we can't do that. You just oh. have to start all over again." Hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't understand that resistance, but. Um, you, your local lab should be able to increase the vertical if you want at a well, cost, at a fee, at a fee, yeah. right? Saying yeah. that it, for some reason it doesn't uh, bond, you know, it's a polymer reaction. That's why we can add to all these different things to begin with and, and have it be stable and strong. And if, if there's something in the material that it doesn't link, then they would know that and, and it, it, they would tell you because they would want you to be able to bond to it and modify it if you needed to. So I, I'm assuming that there's a reason you can. I, I don't use those, so I have I don't have experience. Right. Mark, Mark Murphy talks about just adding uh, just um, powder liquid acrylic internally, selectively, obviously a little bit. To, you know, so it'll lock in. You know, to increase retention at, at times. So he talks about using it to bond to the inside of the appliance to enhance the retention if needed. So if you can do that, I imagine you can build up, it won't be pretty, you know, you, you need to have the lab, lab polish it up and everything, but I, I'm pretty sure they can they can add acrylic to it. You just maybe don't want to take that liability off. Now, if you're talking about your local lab, right, adding material to an appliance that the prosomnus folks made in California, they may not want to take that liability on of futzing around with this appliance, right, in case something goes wrong. I, I'm, I'm thinking it might have more something Agreed. to do with that. Yeah. Agreed. I'm confused. Are we talking about Narvel or are we talking about Prosomnus? No, but we, we jumped to uh, the Prosomnus, uh, because yeah. <laughs> the same issue about increasing uh, the vertical. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, all right. So we're, we're, we're not at the Prosomnus yet, right? Right. Okay. So, so uh, any, anything else about the, the, the Narvel or, or the nylon appliances? John, that is the only device I know of that's been that Levine's group studied, and it's actually in the lit that people without obstructive sleep apnea with a Narval brux less. It actually reduced bruxing events. Ah, uh, you know, can you send me that study? Sure, it's Frank though. Yeah, I will. Yeah, can you please do that? Okay, so the only study I I, I know of done on the Narval around these types of things was published in. Um, I think it was 2006 in France, and um, and in French. <laughs> so, but but what what they showed is it, they compared it to a Herps design, and they they what they what they showed is three things. They showed just by measuring um, muscle activity that the um, uh, um, there was okay. This is their interpretation. I don't know. I'm not gonna they take those words away. It showed very. They, their interpretation was that there was less TMJ stress 
from this design of pulling forward along the horizontal as opposed to pushing forward and obliquely downward, you know, with, with the herps. So they showed, they, they interpreted the results as being less stress on the TMJ. And, um, and uh, of course, the herps appliance uh, forces uh, promoting mouth uh, opening because of, you know, the, the, the angle of, of the force. And so that was, that was um, what, what came out of, of that study there. Now, whether it's the only thing I've ever seen published uh, on, on that. And, and it was specifically comparing this design to the herps obliquely and downward forward pushing as opposed to pulling horizontally. Now, I wonder how they I, I'm sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys speak on that first, and then I have something else I want to share. But I just wonder how they how they measured force. I, I think it's really important. You know, I we Don and I just wrote a, a paper in that's in, going into the uh, highly peer reviewed Dental Town magazine, <laughs> and um, that paper is uh, just a, 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 a short treatise on on potential advantage of an anterior midpoint stop, but in doing our research, we've, there's, there's really some really good lit that demonstrates that much of what we claim or many of the concerns of TM, of temporomandibular joint strain or sprain or forces on the joint or compressive forces on the joint or, or tend to be overstated. I'm not really, when you think about it, I'm not really convinced that any of our appliances by themselves pulling, holding the mandible in an anterior posture, first of all, isn't it, it, the muscle musculature isn't what's holding it there. The, the appliance is. So there's not significant strain on the muscles or the muscle insertions by our appliance. In addition to that, when you look and you see the complex and you see how the mandible is coming down uh, the, the eminence and, and the alteration and what happens to the disc as that as that occurs, there is no whether the force is anterior, whether the force is anterior and down, there is no additional forces, think about this, placed on 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 the joint. The the lateral um, the lateral and medial collateral ligaments are coming with it. The only place you could potentially have some strain is in the pterygomandibular uh, 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 the, the, the 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 quote unquote the, the ligament which you know uh, the retrodiscal lamina, but it, it it's not really it's, so you're really not in it itself isn't straining the joint. The the strain in the joint tends to come when we're out of our safe harbor and we go through some uh, uh, usually some form of of of, of, of power function. So I, I'm not when I when I when I when I hear that I I, I, I the first question I ask is when is it being measured. And the second is how is it being measured? So I, I'd I'd like I'd like to see that. Sure, that'd be great. I agree a hundred percent with everything you just said, Barry. And what they what they looked at is basically muscle activity. And I, I don't recall actually to tell you the honest truth. I had to interpret it using Google inter, you know, yeah. and so I had to piece through this Google interpretation of this French document, you know. Um, and, and but most of it was numbers, so that was helpful, you know. And 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 what they looked at is muscle activity, and it was an increase in muscle activity with the herps device versus the the traction of the of the narval. It was a narval they were comparing. So they have interpreted that, and so once again, it's their interpretation of the data that we're talking about, right? That's not, that's not a, that's a real stretch to make a direct relationship between increased muscle EMG activity. And strain on the joint. That's a real, real stretch. And to suggest that that's a direct relationship, uh, I'm not. I got it. Was I'm sorry. Was it a finite element analysis, John? No, I don't recall, John. I don't. You know what I'll do is I'll that's look. That's the that only up way they can calculate joint strain. Yeah, I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share it with you. Maybe you can get the English version of it. You're so good at finding literature. There's gonna be an English version of that document around. I'm gonna. I'm gonna email it to you. If you can find the English version, I would love to get it so that I could better understand what they did in detail like, like you're talking. Now, one more thing before we leave this slide. This is going to be in common with the previous slide, okay? 
So we realize there's different opinions on the importance of force vectors on this on this uh, form, and that's fine. But when you look here at the previous, let's see now, what we have with the Emma, right? There's a, a lifting force here, okay? And same type of um, when you go forward with the um, the DSAD style with the horizontal traction, there's also a lifting force here. So as a matter of fact, if you if you place these devices, I I have a little bit of experience with the Emma style appliances. I have tons of experience with this uh, this style of appliance here, the nylons. I can tell you one of the first things I look at in someone's mouth when I'm considering making them a DSAT appliance is do we have nice bulbous molars on the bottom? Because I yeah. need to know I can grab onto those teeth. Because I know the force vectors here, and if they go to open their mouth, right, it's going to just simply lift off the back teeth, right? So I, I imagine the same thing applies with the Emma for the same reason, right? And and that uh, you know, if you wonder about why those force vectors are important, when we talk about where the connectors are, and making sure you have good solid teeth in those areas, these are the reasons. Right, so you know uh, when we look at the connector for the Emma being at the top and the front and the bottom of the, I would suggest that perhaps those it's important that those areas, the dentition need to be solid. Okay, but that's just my opinion on that. Okay, here, one of the outcomes of having this lifting force with with the DSAT appliance, you've got this nylon little nylon protrusions going into proximally. That's how you're engaging. The retention right and every time the patient goes to open and close that appliance has got a lifting type of of a component to it right the force vector and it's like basically having something stuck in between the teeth and lifting up like this you think maybe you're going to end up with a little bit of opening up of the of the embouchures or or you know spacing in between the bottom teeth. and you'll notice that with this particular design of appliance you'll notice that floss will become loose in the posterior mandibular area for that reason. Okay. Another thing too, <clears throat> if um, you're considering an appliance like this and you're, you're looking at a patient that has still the deciduous cuspid up here because their permanent one is up in the bone and never came down, I would suggest not doing that because these appliances are only attached from the cuspid back, cuspid back. So that, it's it's pulling the jaw forward, but all the forces are being concentrated at that cuspid and then on a diminishing level going back. So you need to have good strong cuspids up here and good strong molars on the bottom. So any questions about that or any other thoughts on this design before we move on? Okay, now we get into a monoblock. So these are adjustable. Um, I can tell you that I have, and I proudly say, I shouldn't say it that way, I have zero experience, you know, making either of these appliances. So I'm going to defer to anybody in the group that has made these appliances. I have my feelings, and which is the reason I've made zero of these appliances. I have my concerns about locking somebody in like that. And you know, and then being able to tolerate that. But anyway, I'll leave that to you folks now. Do you have any any thoughts or things to share about this particular design? The only Barry, thing I've ever done, John. Yourself, Barry. Uh, uh, yeah, Years ago, ahead. John, I had a patient that needed an appliance in a hurry, and I just made one out of two suck downs and put it together, and the patient loved it and did fine with it. So, in my case of one more than 10 years ago and worked fine. Right. <laughs> and, and the thing is, you know, that, that may be the case, but how do you tell ahead of time whether that's going to be the reaction or, fuck, I can't wear this, right? You, you know, and I don't want to find out after the fact that they just can't tolerate being locked in like that. You, you can tolerate a Moses as long as you like kinesiology to determine the job. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Yeah. Mark has disappeared from the screen here. <laughs> no. I have I have personal issues with Moses. Believe me, uh, I, okay. I, uh, I, uh, I don't want to talk about it. 
Okay, that's cool. Well, any, anyone who has who understands that uh, science isn't a four-letter word is going to have issues. So, um, um, I, I didn't, but I never even realized that, that it was a, it's a monoblock. And 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 the PM positioner, of course, is 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 um, Jonathan's Parker. Right. Nor did I realize that was you know I, I looked at that, but yeah, when you think about that 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 that. Uh, that titration assembly, there's no way that it allows lateral movement. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're both monoblocks. Interesting. Never thought about that. So, you know, when, when Jonathan came up with that, we didn't know a lot of stuff, right? It was very early in the game. And so, kudos to him. He came up with something cool. You know, Alan came up with, uh, you know, out of the three of them, I mean, uh, if, you, if you throw the silencer in there, I like the silencer the best out of the three of them personally uh, for, for reasons. But, but, you know, th this is early stuff. It's not like anybody's looking. I don't know that anybody makes a PM positioner today. I'd be surprised. Although I, I, Moses probably has a pretty good fan base going. I don't know. I can't speak personally. Then. Does anybody so here's know? A, so here's the question. Here's the, I don't know. Here's the question. How much lateral, this is really interesting. How much lateral movement is necessary? Do people really need to move laterally and how far and if you don't allow them to move laterally will it in general be problematic and why i'd like to answer that but i'll let other people jump in first <laughs> uh, it, it, it sounds uh, when you first look at it, it you would you would think that you know, people would sit there and work their mandible back and forth, and we don't really know if, I, if an individual does do it. You can make a case of, well, he bruxes. So if you lock them in, I guess they're not bruxing. They're not moving around. So you could say, oh, that's good, but maybe it's not. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, intuitively, it seems like movement is something that allows each patient to kind of find their own you know, comfort zone, whatever it is that they do. Locking anybody in is is uh, is uh, kind of counterintuitive to me. And I think Jonathan told me one time that he only used that thing, you know, in a pretty small percentage of of people. I think he said ten percent, maybe, which would be something like that. So, so we don't think of uh, Jim. It's interesting because we don't really think of bruxism as 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 something that's comfort. It's just something that happens and why it happens we we, we don't know uh, the question is what happens when you stop someone from doing it and the tendency is to think when you think feel uh, you know logic when you think about it what you're at what what is bruxism well during bruxism we have this periodic uh, very scheduled uh, 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 movement a contraction of the lateral of the lateral turgoid so it's contraction left, contraction right, contraction left, contraction right. That creates the movement. All right. Now, what happens when someone goes to contract and we have no movement? So, I, it certainly in some cases, nothing happens. And in some cases, you get a real, what we call an isometric co contraction, which is like a, uh, an isometric, uh, which will put a, a tremendous strain on the things that attach, like the superior head or the inferior head to on 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 the disc uh so so there's a certainly the possibility that seems that we would cause one some joint damage in a monoblock and certainly the possibility that there are some patients that would absolutely hate being locked in we all know that there are certain patients you got to put a tap in there you know that are attached and said oh i can't stand being locked in and, and you know so we need to go to an appliance that doesn't in their own mind lock them in for the 10 or 15 minutes that it takes for them to fall asleep which is the only time they're they're aware of they're being locked in which is fascinating right yeah. so 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 if we can get them past that 15 minutes we're fine but some people just it's a you know it's it, it bothers them so who is it that gets bothered and who is it that's going to get hurt with, with the contraction when it occurs uh it does in fact the monoblock cause more more joint pain 
than uh, a, a tap. So when the tap has a little receptacle in it, it can only go three millimeters. When you when you put it in a in a, in a, a double bar, you can go eight or nine millimeters. Do I have any reason to believe that patients where I put them in the double bar are more comfortable than when I put them in a receptacle? No. It didn't, didn't. It didn't seem to make. In terms of that, it didn't seem to make a a comfort change. It didn't seem anecdotally as though they needed that additional. So how much do they need? I don't know. It's. It, it is interesting that when you put in an, even an, a, like a some a dorsal appliance, there's a limit to how far those patients can go left and right because of the fins, and yet they don't seem to cause a lot of problems. So I don't know how far that's that's the question. How far does a patient have to go? And 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 and, and maybe there's a reason that the monoblox didn't cause as many problems as I would have thought they would have. Yeah. So I I've had to thin out the the wings on on certain for certain patients yes. to allow them a little bit more lateral movement to get them out of discomfort. I definitely had to do that. It's been a real learning experience with the drain tap. Because the dream tap comes with a little window in the front where the hook slides. And if that window does not allow enough lateral movement in both directions for the patient, and I don't even know how to define enough, because you know, as long as they feel like how I determine it with them is I I'm looking at them straight from the front. I ask them, okay, move your jaw to the right to your left. Do you feel like you've got a you know fairly good range of motion or do you feel like you're you're hitting a wall? That's all I ask them. And if they say, oh, I'm hit, and I'm watching them, and I can see that they're hitting the acrylic on that side. And I, I liberate things a little bit so that they get to the point where, yeah, I feel like I've got a good range of motion. That has reduced the number of adjustment visits afterwards for me dramatically. Because before I was doing that, I would have them come back after two, three days, and it would say, you know, my left, my left jaw is hurting here, my TMJ. And, and so sure enough, they're hitting the wall on the right side. And as soon as I, I saw that and I relieved the acrylic a little bit and they were moving like this, they, they, they felt almost immediate relief when they're moving their jaw, you know, and, 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 and the problem goes away. So there seems to be a certain amount of movement that the patient needs to have, but it's specific to them. There's no like set rule. So it's something worth in, e evaluating when you're delivering an appliance that limits their, their movement right, um, uh, b before you let them go home with it to try and reduce the number of uh, emergency visits you're going to have afterwards. This is what I've found to be the case. However, when you're talking about something like this, you know, for the majority of people, it probably doesn't matter, but you're going to have that person where it does, and I don't want to have to deal with making them a new appliance because they can't tolerate being locked in like that. So this is why I can tell you up front that I have zero experience in making this version of, of an oral appliance. So anything you know, else for me? Yeah. Let's go back to dream tap. I've basically yeah. given up doing dream taps. I'll never do another dream tap. I've had more repair problems, more breakage with dream taps than any other appliance I've ever used. What type of breakage have you had, Don? I've had people rip the wire out of the front four times, literally okay. destroy it. So, so are, you, are you making break. the Medicare wire, the thicker one, or just the, the standard yes. wire it comes with? The Medicare wire. They're all thick. Thicker okay. wire. Yeah. I've had. One patient broke two, two hooks. Uh, so it, it, and problems I've never seen with the original tap design. Yeah. I've had the same I've, I've had problem with their standard wire, but I've not had problems with their, their Medicare wire. So I just, by default, order all of them with a the thicker wire. There's something about putting that attachment that far forward that gives them a mechanical advantage that just, in some patients, it overwhelms the device. Yeah. And I don't know how to predict that, so the easy way is to just not do them. Yeah. Okay, anything else on this before we move on? So, by block interlocking, uh, now we're talking about the interlocking, right? Uh, the, the dorsal appliances, basically, right? Horizontal compression. So who, who has a lot of experience? Barry, you have a lot of experience with this particular design appliance. Yes. What would you like to share with us? I just want to say it is 5.04. Um, I mean, I'm not in a rush, uh, and we can continue going. The whole thing is being taped, and it's going to be archived. So if, if anybody does have to leave because of other commitments, I won't feel hurt. 
um, you can always check out the archive and, 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 and it'll be a video so you can just go into it to the where you, where you left off and continue watching. But if you want to stick around, uh, we'll continue until we're finished uh, all, all the categories. So Barry. I'm going to have yeah. to. I really, found it. Okay, Mark. Take Bye. Care. Bye. Bye. Enjoy. Great seeing you, Mark. Take care. Stay well. Stay well. Um, yeah, the, my history with the with these is kind of interesting. I uh, was approached in 2005 by Somnomed. Uh, they wanted me to, uh, to teach it, and I looked at the I looked at the design and I declared that it can't possibly work. Because we know that when the mandible drops open, um, the airway tends to become more compliant. The hyoid bone drops, and the airway becomes more compliant. So, not, I looked at the design. I said it can't can't possibly work. And and uh, I get uh, a series of studies that are sent to me, um, several of them by Peter uh, Sestuli, and uh, who is a, one of our top researchers, in, in, in he's out of Melbourne. Uh, Australia and I looked at it and, and it looked better and better and it looked really good in terms of the, the studies so they encouraged me and I went ahead and made a few of them and um, patients there were sometimes the patients really liked them uh, and were comfortable with them and one of the things I really like about any appliance that isn't attached is that it requires less retention so in terms of comfort, I think we, in gender, general in dentistry, we, we make a mistake of making appliances tighter than they need to be, and that alone has the potential to be problematic in terms of afferent nociception and, and elevated, uh, 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 elevated state uh, uh, that causes increased discomfort, not only in the teeth. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a lot of our problems with night guards and with a lot of things that we do in dentistry. Uh, so I really, but for, I realized right away that even with the tap, it requires X amount, less than we think it needs, but less amount of retention than, than a tap would need. And for our chronic pain patients, it made a lot of sense to me. So that's when I started using it. And then I started using it more and more and more as they, um, um, uh, as, because I wanted to get some experience, I was going to do a national tour with them, which I did. Um, it what we what what suddenly came to uh, we came to realize is that as long as you move the mandible slightly forward, so you don't start it in uh, you don't have to start it at uh, a, a significant protrusion. Uh, I don't you know I don't like to use percentages, but you don't like to you don't want to start for for sake of communication. You didn't want to start it. You don't have to start it at seventy percent. If you start it relatively a few millimeters forward, what happens is that that the rotation alters and the mandible can't open at the same rate the same way that it can from centric so so even while some appliances you can start at centric at, at, at what what is a mandibular relaxed position and keep the mandible from going back you can't do that with these appliances because it'll open up on you and 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 and, and throw you off in terms of uh, airway compliance but as long as you bring that mandible at least two millimeters from that position or so, you don't have that same a, a, a amount of opening, which is why the appliances on an unattached version uh, were still working. Uh, it took us a while um, to figure that out. I also was concerned about the lack of uh, lateral movement, but then again, uh, turned out that that, 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 that wasn't uh, wasn't a problem. So I found that the appliance really had some really good usage in terms of the patients that were uh, dental, you suspected were uh, uh, or had a history of uh, dental hypersensitivity, uh, awareness of their of their occlusion or their, or their or their teeth in terms of pain or discomfort, uh, and, uh, and you're worried about or you're trying to put less forces. So using a, a, a dorsal appliance bringing it forward at least two millimeters, and then for reasons that I don't think we'll get to today, but uh, maybe some other, other, well, Don's going to do a, a whole seminar uh, coming up on why we use anterior midpoint stop appliances. So um, for reasons that he'll explain, putting an anterior midpoint stop appliance in, a, in, in the sound of med um, was, we, we found to be extremely successful. The, the company was making really top-notch, consistently, 
really well done appliances they were uh being at that time no one knew it you were sending them this to, to to uh denton texas and they were sending them uh essentially 95 percent of them were being made in china uh, i know that doesn't surprise anybody um uh and and they've gone through lots of changes and i can't speak for some of them now um uh, in terms of the quality of their appliances I, I i that's not a negative or positive i just don't know but i do know that um they went through some some bad years but uh the the design uh, really really once we understood about uh how we could prevent the the drop from being a problem the design made a lot of sense and there were those patients who do like the the fact that you can drink water without taking it out they do like the fact that that they, they feel less um uh attached uh than 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 uh what, what was what's the only thing i'll say before i stop is that while we think that that's going to be a, a, a more comfortable design because they're not attached, basically, honestly, the patients don't have anything to compare it to. So when we give them a tap that attaches them, it's not that they're now comparing it to the Sonomed that doesn't, and that's their appliance, and the vast majority of patients are extremely comfortable with it very, very quickly. So it's, it's not the issue that we think. The other thing I'll say is that there's the choice, the two choices, with this appliance with an internal structure, you can usually use their, their Biflex, which is their proprietary soft material, which is excellent. Or uh, they're, they're plain acrylic uh, 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 appliance that is not milled. We'll talk about milled, but hopefully we'll get to Prosomnus and talk about um, the issues that, uh, 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 about ideal, perfect fitting. Well, you're on, this is, this is the slide. Prosomnus is part of this. It's okay. one of the dorsal appliances, yeah. Okay, so the so uh, so uh, when we when we talk about uh, soft, the tendency is to think that a soft appliance is going to be more comfortable, and the reality is is that that's not necessarily true, and that the softer appliances really require a larger profile. You've got to have that soft material into the well into the uh, uh, undercuts uh, below the height of uh, uh, of uh, help me. Contour. 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 It's these dental terms are so confusing. <laughs> so the, the side of height of contour, uh, but uh, below that, and and with with the with the with the uh, thermocryl or the the acrylic material, not the thermocryl, the acrylic, it it wasn't it wasn't as required. Um, uh, so so you can have a smaller uh, um, a profile, which is something that that I that I that I preferred. So. Having said all that, uh, I, I found I found that it's advent, totally advantageous to have some dorsal appliance. If you're going to pick two or three appliances as part of your armamentarium, it made, makes total sense to me to have the dorsal as one of them. The Prosomnus dorsal, I, you got to give credit to this company. They came on the on board. They responded. They learned their 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 sleep. They got good people. They have uh, formed an incredible company that responds extremely well to dental requirements and dental needs. Uh, they uh, created a new dorsal with a with a with an angle at ninety percent that claims, uh, as we discussed before. I, I'm not convinced the claim is valid, but nevertheless claims that uh, it holds the mandible in a better position. They then went to a milled appliance and, and that could be done in terms of a, and response to digitally and showed how better fitting those appliances are when in fact they're milled and, and off a digital impression. From my standpoint, uh, Don and I have talked about this a lot, uh, that lack of tolerance isn't necessarily an advantage. Uh, I don't want an appliance that fits, dentistry does. So we're, there, we're fulfilling a dental need that has nothing to do with sleep. Dentistry likes perfection, wants it to fit perfectly. Uh, I don't want it to fit that perfectly on those teeth, and teeth move. Uh, and they'll move from the time you take the impression to the time you insert it. Uh, and they'll move between visits. And, and having a, a perfectly, the, 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 if we think that putting these appliances in at night are going to keep the teeth from moving or be healthier because it brings them back to that original position. I, I, I question that, and I question whether that's really a, a valid advantage. There are those that want that, and fine. I, I don't think it's a disadvantage. I just didn't see it 
has an advantage. And I, and I think we, we, we need to look and see how an appliance helps us with sleep medicine, not how it helps us in our heads mentally about with dentistry itself. Uh, but having said that, it's a great company. They make a great appliance. And I think it, that it's, it's a, a good alternative for someone like myself who says that I definitely want a company, have, have a dorsal at my access in my armamentarium. So, so let me add a couple of things. Um, if I was going to be delivering um, a, um, what's it called? The classic, Sonodent Classic, which is basically the acrylic Sonodent dorsal appliance with the little ball clasps. And in comparison to delivering a uh, IA, Iterative Advancement Pro Somnus Dorsal Appliance. And uh, compare the experiences to you. What I can tell you, it's much more likely that uh, the patient is going to, you know, put the appliance in, and I'm not going to see the look of distress on their face. Occasionally, if it's really tight fitting, you know, there's that, you know, the eyes scrunch up a bit, and then that they they get used to the sensation, and of course the teeth shift around a bit. We've all experienced that, and that's fine. I find that this experience is much more prevalent with the prosomnus devices because they are designed to fit so intimately and as Barry mentioned in between the visit to, to make the impressions to delivery the teeth can shift and this is going to vary from patient to patient if there's enough shift when you go to deliver that appliance they actually it's very stressful sometimes you know and you're in there having to uh, relieve the acrylic in order to get it to seat you know all the way properly because they they engaged too much of the contour, but not too much based on the position the tooth was in before, but based on the reposition tooth, now it's become a problem. So I can tell you from having delivered a lot of both styles, which is easier to deliver for the reasons Barry said. And the, the difference though is that with the prosomnus device, it's a much smaller footprint. The whole appliance is smaller all the way around. So because of that, they need to have very good solid retention, good intimate contact all the way around for where the appliance is. The somnodent is a much larger surface area, so it doesn't really need to have as, as, as intimate contact. It won't dislodge laterally. With the prosomnus, unless you have good intimate contact all the way around, they move their teeth around, it'll, the bottom will pop off the teeth. So they need to engage the teeth intimately. So they, they need that type of retention. So it's because of the size of the appliance that they need to have that intimate retention, then it becomes so this is a little bit more challenging when you're delivering it. Now, um, some they, they, they have the opinion that uh, uh, if you're taking the impression digitally uh, versus uh, analog, that that makes a difference. I'm not sure that I, I, I agree with that. I, I think it more has to do with what happened in that particular patient's mouth. Did their teeth shift around a lot between the, you know, in the three weeks that we're waiting for the appliance uh, to be delivered or, or not. Then that's going to vary from patient to patient. So that's just my personal experience with those devices. Don, you've had some experience with the, yes, no? No, I never did use the prosomnus. After talking to John and hearing about brittleness and other things, it just <laughs> meant more chair time and more maintenance. So for me, the prosomnus is economically not a good deal. It is more expensive than, than the classic. I mean, I can, uh, I can get a tap for $350 that I can treat 99.99 out of 100 patients with. And I've got a lab nearby that can repair it for me. I can repair most of them myself. So, geez, it ain't broke. So the only time I do a somnomed is when the patient looks at a tap and says, I'm too claustrophobic to deal with that. And then, you know, then a dorsal type device helps them. But I'm at the point now where I can handle somebody with really minimal vertical. I can handle the monster bruxer. I do place posterior contact on occasion for the patient that destroys appliances. So I can do everything I need with a traditional tap. If I have a patient I know I'm going to titrate a long time, I'll use a tap three elite hook. So ah, it just which, gets me what I chassis, need. Which chassis do you like using on your on your taps? If the patient has anything but really crooked teeth, I'll use Thermacrow. 
The person with so crooked poly, teeth, poly, the poly triple laminate will shell, Polycarbonate shell with a thermocurl liner. Yes. Not their new AccuTherm uh, chassis. Correct. So, so my my uh, for many years, uh, for a long time, thermocurl has been my go-to for many many reasons. Uh, uh, I I just love it, and uh, and I think many dentists. I, I can understand the general dentist who's who's dabbling doesn't want to spend the extra ten or minute ten minutes in insertion. I think those ten minutes are valuable. Uh, I think the ability to take the material out and replace it is 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 incredibly important. Uh, I think to, uh, being able to take it over and, and not be concerned about dentistry or dental changes is incredibly important. Uh, the fact that we can alter the, the, the retention, we can make it tighter in, uh, on, small, on less teeth or less tight on more teeth um, uh, and change that in a second uh, at our whim uh, is incredibly important. Um, I just, uh, and, and I'm now, to this small group, I will tell you, we're in the process, uh, and well through now, uh, an FDA process of bringing uh, another appliance into the country. Uh, it's, it will be called the Morpheus. It's a cap-like appliance. It, John, uh, Don has nine, oh, you know this, it has nine millimeters of protrusion on, uh, and, and fills the void for those people that really like that tap three, uh, but are being essentially forced uh, to to the dream tap uh, and uh, with a with a, a a significant reduction in cost or we're probably looking at maybe three hundred and ten dollars uh, lab fee uh, to do the appliance uh, and and we're working by the way with uh, John with uh, Don Lewandowski to add the uh, apnea guard to those people who want to use that process and now it's a three hundred and fifty dollar charge uh, it includes the apnea guard and the appliance. So um, that kind of so it, it, it we're in the, but that being said I I I am a a big fan for many reasons uh, and liked on and uh, found that it was available it it resolved it's fabulous for gaggers it's fabulous for patients uh, who are you, you want to lower we'll put it out I'll show a photo later. If we want, I, I can show a photo of a, of a case where we put a canine to canine on bilaterally. So uh, there's lots of options that give uh, that it gives us. Okay, so uh, we're done clearly with the dorsal um, design, and um, we're on to the the anterior attached. So this would be the the, the top. Um, you can see there's a picture of a. Um, Orthoapnea, the old silencer, and and this is a picture of the dream tap here. I think we've probably covered off a lot of the the tap. Is there any other information? Nobody makes a silencer anymore. Anybody in the group make a silencer now? No. I don't. I don't know. Orthoapnea is from Spain. I don't know that it's had much of a footprint in in North America. Um, and uh, and then then and there's the, the the various versions of the tap, which I think. We've, we've probably covered off a lot of the information. Anything else that we want to say about the top before we we, we go right by this slide? I'd, I'd like to say say one thing here that the tap kind of has built into it, and that's no posterior contact. So. Well, you can build it either way, right? Yeah, but but I prefer no posterior contact. Right, which is my default also. Um, and I only, what happens, I don't know, this is worth talking about, I'm curious. So my default is um, is basically, in essence, that it becomes an anterior midpoint discluding stop type of appliance, right? And, um, but I find that occasionally, not often, not often at all, but occasionally, I have somebody that complains about, you know, the, the pain on, on the front teeth that it's not resolving. And so once I add, posterior contact, I basically, all I do is I squirt some polyvinyl in both sides, send it in one piece to the lab and say, fill it in. And they put, you know, like a, 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 a basically all the way around contact, you know, to, to the cuspid, cuspid. And it gets rid of their pain and all their complaints immediately, right away. But that only happens very occasionally. What What, what is your experience being on that? Well, that's a really interesting point because it happens very rarely. So if you start for me, and I'm not saying that this is what everybody, 
me, I don't make an appliance without an anterior programmer on it. And, and for a couple of reasons, one, the lab really can't mess up the mounting, okay, laterally or anterior posteriorly. Um, two, as I titrate it and the condyles kind of come down the glenoid fossa, then if I need to add posterior acrylic later, which happens rarely, I do that right in the mouth or take a bite registration like you're talking about. And now you've got that perfectly balanced. Uh, I mean, I just, I just have troubles. They're small. They're, you leave more tongue room in the back without without contact back there if you don't need it. I just can't see much of an advantage to not using an anterior programmer and thermocryl um, on whatever type of appliance we're making. I, I put them on dorsals. I, you know, when I make a dorsal and, and, and I can't imagine myself taking this, it's, it's like you do a crown, okay? And you got a, a crown you're gonna charge a thousand dollars for or whatever. And you get it back from the lab and the first thing you gotta do is you sit there and grind on it for 20 minutes. You, don't you know the patient's thinking, geez, what's, what's wrong with this? I would rather deliver an appliance that I know what I have to do. I have to adapt it with Thermocrel. I have to make it tighter or looser anywhere I want. And I'm not sitting there grinding on the back, trying to make it feel even to the patient. I, mean, I don't know. It's just my thoughts. Makes no, I easier. think they're all valid. Yeah, that's makes it so much easier for me and, and easier for the patient. And I, yeah. I'd rather add acrylic to it. And the, the other thing, thing there, if you have an anterior bump on it, say it's not a tap, and you want to increase vertical a little bit. It's pretty easy to do, just add some acrylic to the bump. And then if you do need to come in and add some acrylic to the back, it's just kind of a built-in articulator. Works pretty well. Yeah. So, enough, enough said there. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else want to add anything? Just that in uh, Allentown, we had a, a day when we had a bunch of people, we were checking with ENGs, and we had two people that could actually create greater force biting on the anterior than they could biting on the posterior. So there are outliers out there that will just be different. Yeah, and, and then you add posterior acrylic to those and exactly a short step. Absolutely. Yeah. My mind. What you described is pretty well the process I followed my office, by the way, is with the top, I would start with an anterior uh, contact only there and only resort to the posterior when it's needed, you know? And um, I still, for the other designs, I still selectively decide whether I'm gonna put an anterior midpoint discluding stop or not. And it depends on their, 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 their shine, signs of wear and bruxing or any complaints of morning headaches and stuff like that, you know? And I mean, I don't know, I'm loosey goosey on that whole protocol. It's all more like what my gut tells me. Uh, but I remember asking Barry, um, a few years ago uh, about, uh, you know, so, you know, when would you not use an anterior midpoint to screwing stop on a steep appliance? And we were driving and he was driving. I was sitting in a passenger seat in his car and he said, well, John, whenever I want to increase master muscle activity by 50% yeah. and temporalis muscle activity by 75%, that's when I wouldn't use it. Exactly. You know? <laughs> At this point, I knew nothing about anterior midpoint to screwing stops. Completely off the radar for me. And I looked I at him with this. Well, yeah, I mean, that puts it in perspective, doesn't it? I get it. Whenever I want to give the patient something to clinch on. <laughs> so, okay, so because we've been touching on the tap uh, throughout the rest of the slides, are we good here? Is there anything else that needs to be said? Okay. So, I don't know. We got that. Now we've got the compression. So, here we must be talking about the oasis. Okay. So, here we are with the Oasis appliance. I think Marcus uh, had to leave us, um, but um, I think we covered off a lot about this also, the fact that it's a very sloppy fit, right? Um, more like a hydraulic type of a fit rather than a you know piston type of a thing. Um, any, any thoughts? Uh, Barry, you wanted to talk about uh, the uh, use of this with the uh, dentures. Yes, we use it with dentures. So it can be not, uh, done a number of different ways. You can, you can, so you use the lower component um, on natural teeth, and the upper uh, denture itself is the upper component, so that the flange from the bottom is is hitting up against the denture. But you need to have 
very good retention on that upper denture. You're using, you're using the maxillary anterior se uh, section as a as the fulcrum, and right. bring the mandible forward that way. Right. Uh, the one of the things that we've experienced is discomfort in uh, the sulcus and the maxillary anterior region. That can happen because you're putting that much pressure on the denture, and if the denture is, is, is such that it, so there were there were times that we actually used patients and had them buy those uh, those denture uh, soft liners that they, they they could put in and just put in the anterior section, and that uh, decreased the compression, the movement into the tissue, and uh, in general helped them. So that that was a that was the one issue that we where we ran in in to trouble with especially with an ill fitting denture, an older denture. Yeah, and that's probably the the, the biggest caveat is you, you want to check to see how well the upper denture fits because as part of getting the steep appliance, maybe it's time for them to have a denture reline prior to making the appliance. Right. You know, to help uh, save that 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 issue. Um, now on on the on the bottom, if they've got a lower denture that's attached to implants. You can actually uh, place the Oasis appliance onto the denture, and on the bottom, on the top, will be the actual patient's denture. So they're, they're actually wearing their upper tissue-borne denture, their lower implant-borne denture, and the lower component of the appliance goes in, right? And, and it, so now you've got somebody that's, you know, uh, complete upper and lower denture wearing a steep apnea appliance. So. And, and because of the way the Oasis fits, um, we've had patients with um, um, that were that have had only teeth from canine to canine with a lower partial, and had them wear their lower partial and make the uh, uh, the appliance because it can fit on the on the partial and the natural dentition on the lower, and then uh, use the upper denture as the fulcrum. The only pr I love the Oasis with an upper dentulus against a denture. My problem is being a Medicare provider, most of those people with an upper denture are now Medicare age and I can't get it covered. Right, exactly. So, I'm, sorry, Mark left. I would love to say, why can't he get another category to avoid the hinge? You know, have hinge for people with teeth and no hinge necessary for people that are upper dentulus. He has tried so hard to work with these people, you know, from, from Medicare. He really has put a valiant effort in there, and they just, they really, um, it's just really tough. I, I don't understand, we, we didn't talk about this earlier when we were on the Optima slide. So the Optima, <clears throat> the appliance, it's made out of nylon with the oral channel, right? They just recently, in the last few months, got Medicare approval. Now, they have Emma straps on there. How the hell did that happen? I mean, I, it's, it's really difficult to believe, but they actually, I saw the document, you know, posted um, on, on, the, on the whatever on the Medicare website. I can't remember the website name. Uh, showing that it's got its number and and it's approved for Medicare. Now I don't know what the implications are because its price point may be a bit high. Although I've been told that you know there um, you know people will have access to it through Medicare. But where it'll help them is through the third-party insurance that will only cover appliances that are covered by Medicare. So you know what I mean? Then, then they can they can go full pop there, but I don't understand how they got coverage on this because it's an Emma strap. Emma Emma doesn't have Medicare. Any thoughts? Did Emma ever try to get Medicare? I'm pretty sure every appliance out there has tried, and 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 if they haven't, it's funny because they know they would have been told no because they don't they don't meet the the, the, the qualifications are pretty specific. And from my understanding of the qualifications as a Canadian, there's no reason that they would have would qualify from what I understood of it before. So I, when I had a little conversation with Len Liptak from ProSomnus on this, we're wondering whether maybe they're starting to loosen the criteria a little bit. This may be the changing of tide. I don't know, because it's just recent in the last few months, the last maybe three months that this happened. If anybody is going to get it done, it'll be ProSomnus. Uh, Dave well, they have their pH got now. a pretty good chance. Yeah, but they have their pH now, so they're good. They have a they have an appliance offering. You know, so that's why, as Mark said, why he came up with it with his uh, 
Herbst uh, appliance. Make sure that they have a, a, a Medicare offering. Here we have Optima, which theoretically should not have a chance of getting um, at that type of status. Got it, and I, I don't, I don't know why. And when I asked them about it, they said it wasn't easy, but we got it. <laughs> so whatever, the Australians can be very influential. So any any other thoughts on the 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 the, um, the caudal basal buttons, Barry or or or, or Dan or anybody um, or the or, or the tongue tongue trainers? Any thoughts on those things at all? I <clears throat> I've used it, and the first thing I have to assure the patient is that it's not going to bite them <laughs> when they it's look at it. It's scary looking. Yeah. yeah, but when I explain, uh, you know, the uh, nasal buttons and the lingual buttons, and I explain it to them. Uh, you know, I do the, the coddle and all this stuff. They go, oh, yeah. And I said, well, you'll get used to it. You can adjust them or whatever. And uh, uh, they, they seem to adapt to it very quickly. And they don't notice these lingual buttons. I've had to adjust the lingual buttons a few times, but there's a sweet spot down under there that they, it, it fits the tongue and they, it tends to help bring the tongue up and forward. And that's what they say. And uh, I think it works pretty well. I agree. I and just like the interesting thing is, I was going to say the interesting thing is, is that for, for you to know how you know that the appliance is fitting properly is the patient should not be able to actually even be aware of the, of the lingual buttons. The, the, they don't, seem to, they no. don't really seem to be after a period of time. Right, it fits into a negative space there. So it, yeah. even initial positioning, right, it needs to fit into that negative space in there when it first yeah. goes in, right? Yeah. Barry, you want to say something? I would, I would just like to see something done that indicates that, I mean, it would be it would be easy uh, because they are, they, they can be added or they can be removed uh, or, be, or turned so that they're not effective. So I would like to see, you know, 30 patients with the appliance as is, and then 30 patients, those same 30 patients uh, all following uh, the accurate placement of the, of, of, of the, of, of the, the tongue, uh, whatever they're called. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's still logic in the absence of science. We still don't have, it, it seems to make sense. It's, it's, but it's no, it's, to me, it's no more, there's no more, we have no more evidence that it's going to be, a, that we need that or the caudal any more than we know that the Zipos strap on the tongue works uh, and helps. That's going to be my question. Did he ever study that? No. Well, the, the, I think not in the way that you suggest, Barry, which I think is absolutely the case. They should be doing that. You know, but, you know, the, the whole premise, as we all know, right, that uh, um, mouth breathing is associated with OSA um, and uh, higher levels of OSA. And uh, that we all know the benefits of nasal breathing, even if it doesn't impact on the level of OSA, it improves many other things and improves quality of sleep. So, you know, oh, 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 the, the, the idea here is that it's only an idea is that, okay, if we're going to be wearing this in my mouth, what, what, what I wouldn't I want to also improve nasal breathing, you know, uh, through a caudal maneuver along with managing my airway. Now, it may make a difference to the apnea, it may not. But I'm pretty sure if you're talking about somebody that has nasal compromised breathing and the caudal maneuver actually improves, right? Can we demonstrate that you do a caudal maneuver and it improves nasal breathing, that that individual is likely to end up with a better quality sleep as a result of it. Now, in that in, in itself would be worthy. But it's never been shown, and, and and when you look at mutes and you look at the other uh, the issues, the the other easy attempts that it, there are to open up the uh, the, the nasal valve uh, to have an effect on the nasal valve, we've got evidence on that. So if you wanted that, why not add a mute rather than uh, something that you don't have any? Which is another alternative, sure. And and there's the bongo. Anybody have any experience with the bongo? I used Brand to play them as a kid. Uh, yes, I, I, yeah. I, I have a set too. <laughs> no, but seriously, anybody have an experience with the bongo? It's it's really relatively new over the last several months, and um, pretty sure it's available in the states. I know it's available now in Canada. It's out of Seattle, uh, the the distributor. I can't remember the gentleman's name now. Um, anyway, so no, nobody's had any experience with the bongo. Okay. 
but it's just another nasal nasal enhancement tool. Okay. So I think we're good with the Oasis. So just you know a few a few slides to click through quickly uh, just to sum up. Basically, appliances with unique features. Um, when I talked about nylon appliances, I think I I showed you the slide about you know the the size. So we don't need to belabor the point here. Clearly, nylon gives us a, a, a smaller footprint. There's no question. And the same thing applies to the CAD CAM appliances. We talked about durability that comes with the nylon appliances. Now, none of these appliances have all the answers, right? There's there's pros and cons. Um, along with the durability factor comes, you know, there's the nuances associated with adjusting them, fitting them around new dentistry and so forth. We know that. The prosomnus. They came out with their prosomnus herps, much smaller in footprint than the classic herps. So that sort of makes it unique. And then what they they have their continuous, their CAs are continuous advancement appliance, which is similar to say a dorsal or sonobent um, appliance. Now they've come out recently in the last few months with their CA low profile. And what it is is basically a smaller footprint. And it's a screw that only goes forward three mils at a time, so that uh, you have to swap out the bottom um, um, uh, appliance uh, two or three times to get you know forward the nine or 12 millimeters. But it's a smaller footprint, so they keep going for smaller, smaller, strong, and and uh, with with at least they're continuing to give us the adjustability that we need. Then of course we talked about the. Um, the Avant, you know, CAD CAM, small footprint um, with, with the soft liner. And uh, we were talking about How the, is that adjusted, John? The strap is How replaced. Is the Avant you come, yeah, you, you replace the whole strap. So it's uh, the strap goes from ear to ear and you take it off. It's it's easy to take off and put on. And you come and you get with a, a whole series of straps. Okay? The, the, the thing that is unknown to me right now, I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you were on, Don, then, was that they do stretch. And I'm trying to determine, you know, um, you know, how long they last before they, they stretch. I, I need more and more patients to be able to get a handle on that. I know that what I'm being told by them, I don't believe, because I've been told that they only stretch about a half a mil, and and that's it. And I, I just don't believe that's the case from my experience in my mouth. So I need to have more and more patients' mouths to be able to 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 know better what what that is. Of course, <clears throat> here we have the the MyTap. We talked about uh, the different uh, uh, temporary appliances earlier. I don't know if anybody's had any experience with their new AccuTherm body, which basically is, is, is the same type of uh, thermocryl that's inside the MyTap, same generation of, of thermocryl, and that used uh, laminated to this polycarbonate shell. And um, it, you know, you, you could refit it uh, uh, over and over again. You can add little beads, little white beads, if, you, if, if you're lacking in retention, and so on the spot, you know, enhance the retention. You don't have to take another impression, send it back to the lab. So it's interesting. The, the, the thing that's, the jury's out for me on this one, and I've placed a good number of these now, is durability. I'm not quite sure how long the, these chassis are going to last relative to the, you know, the triple laminate or, or, or carbonate with the thermocryl lining. So that, that's the, their small footprint. That's nice about them. And it does everything they say it's going to do, but I'm not I'm not sure about the durability. You know, how long you can expect to get out of these. And then of course we've 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 known about the attachments. Um, this is a top cap uh, tap tap uh, chair side combination therapy. Um, we've talked about the optimum, and we talked about the Oasis with their unique features with the the tongue buttons and and the nasal buttons, right? And here's a picture actually courtesy of Mark, uh, showing an implant retained denture and a full upper uh, tissue borne denture on, on an Oasis appliance. So it is, uh, geez, 543. And you know what, there's 15 people still on, um, down from I think it was about 35 or 40 at the, at the peak. So considering we went 43 minutes past the mark, uh, you guys are troopers. It was, I think, really great sharing. And that's what this is supposed to be about, not about, you know, Barry or me or any other one individual lecturing. That's all over the place. This is an opportunity for everybody to share their own experiences with each other. So we all come away learning, and that's, that's, that's great. 
Um, I, I thank you uh, all for your participation. I want, since you guys are still here, I'd like to know your idea about the topic next week. Um, what I had posted was, you know, how to seal the deal, like the, you know, basically, you know, having the people, the patient see the light and say yes to proceeding with therapy. That's a whole little art in itself. There's all sorts of different things talked about, and and that's I, I think important. But maybe right now, what's even more important is we're going to all be going back to work soon in the next few weeks. Some of us have already started going back to work. So maybe we can share our um, collective experience and thoughts of what we've heard on other webinars, what we've read, uh, what we've already put in place at the office, and you know, like, and 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 we can, you know, like, sort of like uh, share these ideas so that we can all benefit from them. Um, we can still talk about how to seal the deal, but I think this other topic might be a little bit more timely, um, and maybe we could start off with this other topic. And then to jump into how to seal the deal afterwards if, if we still have some steam in us. So what, what are your thoughts, those of you that uh, have an active microphone? Like it sounds Very, like a good idea. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to talk about, um, you know, um, returning to dental sleep medicine post-COVID, right? And uh, I'll, I'll post that online so people know. And um, the idea is, that, yes, Barry, yes? There's someone else that just, just turned their mic on, so... Uh, That's just me, Barry. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know, so the idea is like you know, we've all been watching different webinars. Some of us have already put things in place. Some of us are already back at work. Not me. I mean, we're, we're not allowed to yet. So, so I think this would be a timely moment for us to share what we've all learned and what we're all thinking um, going forward. And then you know, we can, if we have time after that, we can jump on this topic here: how to seal the deal. I, it, would be, it would be my preference. I mean, you can leave it as seal the deal, but I think of that in terms of, um, uh, in general, patient management. Uh, I think it's 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 uh, uh, okay. Little, so so you know, I like that, Barry. Little, so what are we talking about? Patient management post COVID. Post COVID patient management. It, 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 -COVID patient management. It, so sort of selling together. selling an appliance. Uh, seal, seal the deal sounds business like, and yeah. it, it always. No, well, I went, I'm old enough to re, to remember dental school dentistry before anyone knew what it meant to close a deal. And yeah. anything, <laughs> anything with the deal on it, kind of, I've kind of uh, rubbed love me, it. Rubs me wrong. Love it, love it. Agree with it. Okay, so um, uh, patient management post COVID, right? Yeah. That'll be that'll be the topic. Everybody's in agreement. Two thumbs up if everybody feels good yeah. with that. Okay. Yeah. So, good job, Barry. Post COVID, thank you, Barry. Good and, job. Uh, so, Good job. Yeah, I'll post that. Thank you very much, folks, for sticking out. Um, it's like, uh, geez, 547. That's that. That's really great. Wow. I, I, I admire uh, the, your passion for this, which I could talk about this all night. So I love it. And um, thanks very much. You for brave soldiers. Yes. Thank you very much for participating. Thanks, everyone. And all we'll right. see you Bye, next Wednesday at three o'clock. Yeah. Good, Good night. Bye. Have a good night.